this is the computer. There we go. Because actually, I didn't even record it on Wednesday. Okay. The difference between personal income and business income is number one, business income is pretty much well defined as to what it is. In other words, we don't mingle it. Okay. Business income is accounted for um, by categories when you're doing the business accounting. It doesn't, uh, <laughs> like, like I said, Sheila, you, you'd be able to explain this very well. It is categorized in ways that personal income isn't. In other words, we have it specified as where it's coming from, and we usually have to monitor it because in our cases, as individuals, we aren't tracking it for taxes necessarily all the time, even though we should. But for businesses, they are always tracking it uh, because they want to know whether it's tax deductible and whether it's not. So it's well classified as to what type of business income it is, what its source is, and what it's being used for. Because they want to get rid of it because they want to basically make their income zero because that's what they get taxed on. Okay. So they have it broken down very specifically as to what, what business income is. Okay. Business income is gross earnings that are reportable. Now, by reportable, it means actually physical earnings. Um, and they include both tangible and perceived value of goods and services. Now we'll get into the perceived value of goods and services. Um, but what it means is a lot of times when we're, when we sell things, we don't always sell them for cash. Sometimes we sell them for other objects or sometimes we sell them for what we think they're worth. Um, a lot of times there is a situation like a uh, good old fashioned baseball cards. Anybody remember those? They used to be valued at incredible amounts but it was whatever they would be bought at the time that established their fair market value. Okay, and we'll get into the fair market value here in a minute. Um, the earnings are typically reported in the year that the actual funds are received. So in other words, if you actually are purchasing something, if you're receiving payments for it, it's in the year that the final payments are made when title is actually exchanged hands. If you're doing a an actual purchase like um, a single item where you're buying tennis shoes. You buy tennis shoes, in that year, that sale would be reported. So if you bought them in 2017, the sale would be reported in 2017. Now if you're buying a car, um, the car goes up for sale, and if you're buying it from the dealer from installments, then what will happen is, is it will be reported in the year that you make the final payment, not in the year that they actually um, that you start making payments. Now, if they actually do, how, however, if you make a, buy a car and they actually have an outside company as your loan company, they do make the sale at that time and then the loan company carries out loan for the year. So there's a difference there, okay? So understand that. If the final sale for the item you're receiving, the final payment, that is the year it gets reported in. Okay, now there is an exception to this. This is the very important one. This is probably the most, most important one, especially to real estate investors. Taxes on an item are in the year you make the sale. Okay, that's the year it gets taxed on. However, if I'm investing in real estate or I'm investing in uh, investment properties, that sort of thing especially, I don't wanna pay taxes on it. Okay, I get, I get it out I'm probably going to buy another one just like it. Okay, I take I sell this house. I got five hundred thousand dollars sitting here. I'm going to go spend it on another investment house. Okay, I don't want to get tax on that five hundred thousand dollars. So in that special case, they will defer the tax. Now it is not tax free. It is a deferred tax, and it's called a 1031 exchange. That's because of the section of the code, the IRS code. The codes for it is the 1031 section, section 1031, and it will allow you to roll over the funds from one investment to another. It's the same thing you do with your, like your IRAs. If you're getting an IRA and you're changing uh, companies that you're working for, they roll it over to your new company or roll it over to the new investment firm. However, if you just if you don't specify that you're going to roll it over to a new account, what happens? 
you get immediately get, you get taxed on it. You get cashed out. And unfortunately, it gets cashed out in that year. So unless you make the specification, we're going to go over this because this one's, this one's important. This is actually on the test. There are some questions about the 1031 exchange on the business test. So we want to go over that, and we will in some detail. But just know at this point that that is one of the uh, ways you do avoid the taxes in that year for income. All right. Now, this is an important update that was made. And this is um, an update that was made in 2018. It is called the Transition Tax on Untaxed Foreign Earnings. Now, this involved businesses for their income. Let's say you're a business and I have a subsidy business, a subsidiary business in another country. Now, think about it. A lot of times, we as a U.S. company, now remember, we're not talking about an individual anymore. We're talking about businesses. Okay, businesses often own other businesses, especially in foreign countries. Uh, Nike owns production companies in outside company in countries, Mexico, China, Japan, you know, outside countries where they have a lot of their production made. Uh, same thing holds true with, well, Kenmore used to, but uh, Nike, um, I'm drawing a blank. Um, a lot of the I've got a client who has a subsidiary business in Austria. There you go. And what happens is, is those foreign countries, they consider them um, a, a lot of them, especially like the Philippines as an example, they have production companies there. They have a lot of call centers there for us, com for us, uh, companies and they're owned by us companies. Um, so the, one. yeah, there you go. So, they get special tax rates. In other words, they almost don't get taxed in some cases, even when they come into the country and put that up because they know that they're providing jobs for their local people. They don't get taxed on that income. So what happens is they basically, the U.S. companies, get that money tax-free. Simply they own it in another country and they are getting that money tax-free. Because uh, it's not being taxed by the other country, and it's not by, it being taxed by us because it's considered a foreign country. So, in January 19th of 2018, the IRS issued a special notice. That's notice 2018-13. This is one. You, this is one you guys really should know. And this was specifically a one-time tax because they wanted to. They sh they saw all this outside income that these shareholders had. And they said, you know, that's not right, guys. You guys have all this income that you're using as basically U.S. income, but because it was in an untaxed foreign country, you guys are basically getting it tax-free. So it is based on the earnings of foreign subsidies, subsidiaries of U.S. companies, and it falls under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and what it says is on all of those earnings, they are um, repatriated. In other words, it's treated just like it was a U.S. tax. So that, that those funds are now considered U.S. funds because they're owned and controlled by a U.S. company. And they're being used by a U.S. company. So they're being treated as if they are a U.S. company. And their earnings are being taxed at a flat rate of 15.5%. Now, this was only a one-time tax, and it, and it was from just 2017, but it may or may not be continued over and allowed in 2018. That's the debate right now. It, it was in effect for 2017 and before. This, came, this was actually written in 2018. Um, and it was a one-time tax. It was only on shareholders that own 10% or more of a controlled foreign co corporation. In other words, we have complete control of this company over in this foreign country, and we are not getting any tax pro proceeds from it. But yet, it is basically a U.S. company. And we're getting all the profit, or they're getting all the profits from it and everything, just like it's sitting in the United States but they're not getting taxed anything on it. So what we did was, is the IRS said, look, you guys are getting all the money from it. So if you own 10% or more of the company, we are now gonna tax you on what those profits were. 
and they went back and for that year they they actually uh, taxed them at a rate of 15.5 percent now they did give them an out because who knows how much it is and what it says is that it can actually be paid over a period of eight years okay so they could they could make installment payments if they actually owed so much okay so they did give them that break so but you know some of these were millions and millions of dollars in profits that these uh that these corporate owners had so that is an important law update you should know uh note it somewhere um as it uh it probably won't affect any of our customers i don't know of any of our customers coming to us that own one of the you know fortune 500 companies but it may be very possible um if they are great because especially we don't do corporate taxes usually like that so um but this very well could be on the test all right all right now of the reading this one is really important. Publication 525, it actually has a lot of things in there now. I realize it's boring reading and it's actually not a short, it's not that short, I think it's like 16 pages, I can't remember. But it is not exactly fun reading, but it literally does specify a lot of things in it as to what is taxable and non-taxable income. And it's one you should have at least kind of read through before before taking the test um the small the tax guide for small business as you know that one is pretty much for all of our clients and what anybody who has a small business even if it's a sole proprietorship we should go through this again you should have read this at least one time i know it's a long book and yes i know it's boring because i know the reading is like dry so it's it's a tax book, but it is one that you really should go through. And the fi the final one is passive activities. Now, I can't say, you know, passive activities to me are the greatest thing in the world um, because they get you money for doing nothing. Um, but what you need to do is, you know, an initial investment or initial activity gets you an income on a return on your income on your investment but what it's saying is this is the guidelines for it because there are certain things that specify as to if it's if you are materially participating in it and if you are not and those are some really important rules to know but out of these three the taxable and non-taxable income one is one of the most important ones and the tax guide for small business is really really important um, of the forms, there's really only two major forms for tax income. The rest is the tax return. Um, there is two forms, and they're actually really related. They're both the passive activity uh, reporting forms. One is the 8582 and the 8582 CR. This is the 8582 is for losses, and the 8582 is for credits. Now, I'm going to go into these in a little bit when we get into passive activity. But right now, just note that those are the two forms that you should have available to you to go over. And we will discuss that when I catch it, when I get up to that. Um, just one, let's carry over from that. All right, types of income. Guys, what type, what type of income can you think of? What are, there's really two types of income. There's only two types of income. Active what and I, passive. Give that woman, that is active earnings, which is income received from activities in which the business material material or participate. Okay, dry mouth is killing me. I am so tired of diabetes. Materially participates in the passive income. That's income received from activities in which the company has invested but does not actively participate in. And it's such as like rental income property or something that they do um, on the side, some business activity where they start it and then they get proceeds from it, but do not uh, actively participate in it. Okay. Best kind because you make money in your sleep, honestly. 
Um, so let's go into this. Sources of income. Business sources of income. You guys think of what some of the most common sources of income would be? Anything offhand? Sales. Sales. Sales of merchandise, sales of services, regular income. Okay, well, let's go down the list. Income received for services. Income received for manufacturing um, or selling of merchandise. The gains from the sale of a business or investment property. Because remember, you are going to be paying that. That is now considered part of your income. Um, so it is the gains on that. Income from the discharge of indebtedness. Now remember, that is income to you. Okay, that's not uh, um, something that just goes away. If you've had a debt, and we're going to go into this a little bit, if you've had a debt and it's been, been discharged, that debt still counts against you. You still, it's considered as income to you because you're being given that money. So we'll go into that here in a little bit. Income from an interest in an estate or trust. So estates or trusts give you uh, funds and you uh, can have to count that as income if you're a business. Portfolio investment uh, income from investments, simple. You're making uh, stock investments, business investments, the uh, income from it, that's always counted as income. And this is probably one of the most important one and it's probably one of the most difficult to understand. The fair market value of property or service from bartering. Now, we're gonna go into this one a little bit, but, and then finally, rental activities and royalties. That one's pretty self-explanatory. If you have a rental property, the rent from it, it you know, or royalties on anything you've sold, where movie rights, anything like that, those are coming to you, book rights, book royalties, anything like that, or coming to you, rental activities, that's all rental income. All right, here's the important one. Let's get a definition here. And this is the important one. It's the fair market value. Does anybody know what it really means by fair market value? This is one we were talking about with bartering. If you were to go and try to buy it on like other private party, what would it cost you? Pretty close. Pretty close. The IRS actually has a definition for it. And the IRS, IRS defines fair market value as the price at which a property would change hands between a buyer and a seller under normal market conditions. So in other words, you know, with no duress, nothing forcing this, this is not a fire sale. Um, so, you know, you're not having to get out of it. You know, you're not having to, you know, this is not something like I've got to sell tomorrow. Okay. Nothing like that. It's, this is under normal conditions with no, no stress. What, what would you sell it for? And it goes as an average. And this is actually how real estate does its property value. In other words, they look at the property and they look at the sales in a given area and it must be the same type of property. And that's how they establish for this type of house, a three bedroom, two bathroom, 1500 square feet on a quarter acre lot within one mile of this address built within five years on either side of this property. So if it was built in, in 96, it's gotta be from uh, 91 to 2001, you know, so it has to be in that in that range and uh, it you know that's what an actual comparable is for real estate and built hopefully the same style too same style so it can't be you know a uh, tudor house versus you know another type of house that sort of thing um and that's how it's looked at and then any improvements to the inside that's actually taken out you know how what's the condition how how well it's been maintained and what it would sell at establishes what its fair market value is, especially you take an average of at least three of them, and that will give you, for that particular house in that particular area, what its fair market value is. 
Now this is really important for real estate and for bartering because a lot of times we don't consider that as, we don't look at it really as a form of income. You know, somebody trades something for something. You figure, well, I just got this for it. Well, it's got a value and we have to actually uh, figure out what that value is to you and what that value is to the, to the IRS. So that's an important term to know. Again, like I said, when we're coming to the tax portion of it, they want to know about a 1031 exchange. You want to get rid of your taxes always. You want to defer them. Now, this is really important. A 1031 exchange, okay, it's the sale of one investment property and the use of the proceeds from the sale to purchase a replacement investment property within a set time period. And that's really important, that definition, that you understand it. Okay, it means you have one house. You are selling that house. And within a certain amount of time, the proceeds from it, all the money from it, must be used to purchase another property, investment property. Now, there are certain guidelines that have to be met here, and that's what's important. Here is probably the most important one that gets missed all the time by investors and it costs them dearly. It must be declared before the sale of the first property. Okay, that is one of the problems that most of them have. They go into it, sell a property, they sell one of their investment properties and they go, oh, I'm gonna do a 1031 exchange. You can't do that. Okay, you have to actually specify and there are a number of companies that handle 1031 exchanges, and that's all they do for a reason. There's a lot of people who lose a lot of money because they do not defer the taxes in the sale of an investment property. And as a result, they lose that tax benefit. Now, to declare it, who do you declare it to? Any ideas? The IRS. Thank you, Department of Revenue. That's when, actually who. When I was doing real estate, one of the properties that um, I was selling was being done as a 1031 exchange. 1031 exchange. And they're actually not that hard to do. Is actually there are some companies. Talk, knock it off. They're really not that hard to do. But if you do not declare it beforehand, it basically makes, makes it null and void. You can't go back and put it back together, okay? Um, because you have to declare it because there's a certain number of days in which you have to identify the property and a certain number of days in which you have to purchase the property. And that's where it says, it's very important, where it says within a set time period. Um, it's really important, okay? Here's the second thing that ha you have to understand it must be a like kind property. Now, what does that mean? It means that it must be an investment property. So in other words, I can't say that I'm selling my, you know, 10 unit condo here, or my, my 10 unit uh, uh, rental uh, property, and I'm going to use the proceeds to buy myself a beach house, okay? They're not like kind. One is for me to use, and one is for, rental investment. Those are not like kind properties. Okay. Now here's the difference. If that beachfront house, if you're going to turn it into a vacation property, like a, an Airbnb, that would be acceptable. But if I'm going to go live in it, no, it's not acceptable. Okay. So it must be a like kind property. In other words, an investment property for an investment property. Okay, now the other thing is this, it must be by a like kind property. I can't take the, the money out of a house, like I have that rental property, that's an eight unit, eight unit uh, rental property, and I cannot sell it and take that money and put it into an IRA or some kind of investment program. Okay, it doesn't count because that is not a like kind property. In other words, it's going from a physical owned rental property into a financial instrument, okay? 
that cannot be done. You can't move it from um, like a rental property into like an investment plan or something like that, a mutual fund or something of that nature. However, there is kind of an exception to that. There is an allowed move to go from an IRA investment into a rental property. Now that's an exception only because the IRS knows and the government knew that a lot of people have money in their 401ks. Now those are not directed by you. Okay, the 401ks really are not controlled in a sense by you. And a lot of individuals wanted to control their own real estate, or their own re retirement plan. So what they did was they actually allow people to take the money out of an IRA or a 401k and move it as a, an investment, as a 1031 exchange to rental properties. That is the exception. Okay, it is allowed to go from a financial instrument to rental properties. And that's the only direction it can go. Okay, where it's a where it's not exactly a like kind. It's for that initial purchase. Okay, that's the only exception. But a 1031 exchange, you have to have if you have anybody who has rental properties, let's put it this way. Any of your customers comes to you and has a rental property, you need to discuss, are you considering selling it this year or are you considering doing anything or maybe getting a different kind? Because the one thing you want to consider beforehand is tell them to get a 1031 exchange or tell them to look into a 1031 exchange to avoid that tax penalty. Because if they don't know, or just ask them, do you know about a 1031 exchange? Um, the reason is most of them don't, especially if they're brand new or they've just heard of a 1031 exchange and they don't know what it is or even how it works. So what'll happen is, is they'll put their house up for sale and it's great. You know, they put their rental property up for sale. Yes. Yes. That's the other thing that it's used for. 1031 exchange is used, um, for insurance and annuities, because it, it, it'll it go from financial instrument to financial instrument. So that is one of the things, because it's uh, rental properties. I just typically use that as the example. But yes, it can be used for insurance and for annuities. It's the same thing if you're moving from one to another, okay? And it's, it's like it says, it's basically like a rollover, okay? That's what you would call it as a, a rollover from one to another, okay? Now here's the most important thing that they need to understand. Some of them assume that means these taxes are now tax-free because you're not paying taxes on it, right? So does that mean it's tax-free? It's tax-deferred. No. Okay, it's a major difference between tax-free and tax-deferred. What happens is, is when you sell that final property, and this is where a lot of real estate investors get killed at the end because they decide they're going to get out of real estate and they start selling off their rental properties and they may have two or three rental properties. They sell them off and what happens? They get hit with the taxes for all the ones they, they sell then. And it's for all the profits on all those properties. They've been building up over time, so they've been passing on. And in that final one, you can have a lot of profit built up there. You know, so you may have a lot of uh, tax liability, a lot of gain on those final properties. So on, in that last one, especially when they're getting out of real estate, because for whatever reason, a lot of times they're getting up there in years and they decide they don't want to deal with rental properties anymore. And so they start selling them off, and as a result, they end up with a very large um, tax tax bill at the end. So it is tax deferred. It is, and that's the important thing, because that is on the test. Okay, 1031, at least it was on the test previously, taxes on a 1031 exchange 
are not tax free, they are tax deferred. Now, trivia question. Anybody else name another instrument that is tax deferred? That most people have a tendency to. An IRA. Thank you. There's one. 401k. Remember, those are pre tax dollars, they're not post tax dollars. Now, can somebody name me something that is tax free? This one's really cool, especially considering Congress actually wanted people to start investing in themselves, so they made sure that it's actually tax-free, and there's a reason it is. Can somebody name what it is? A Roth IRA? Nope. It's really cool, and most people don't know oh, it. Yeah, you pay taxes on a Roth IRA because you've already paid a it's after taxes. Yeah, that's true. Roth IRAs. Yes, I'm sorry, I stand corrected there. But there's another one I was thinking of. U.S. savings bonds? No. Keep going. It's an important one. It's something that actually Sheila, <laughs> Sheila actually mentioned it in a sense because she doesn't realize she mentioned it. Muni bonds? Kind of like, it was kind of one of the areas that she was talking about here. What well, was okay, one thing that most of us don't even think about is tax-free. And it depends on how you just look at it. Because they turned it into an investment me method. Anybody know? Okay. It's life insurance. Up most to 50,000 only. Yeah. yeah. Most people don't realize that life insurance, they've made it be into, because think about it, you are making the payments into life insurance at uh, after tax, with after tax dollars, right? So that means that it is considered a purchase that you've already paid taxes on. So it's gonna build up stuff, so they actually made it Tax-free is an investment. They decided to make the law to finalize it so that the interest on life insurance is considered tax-free. So as an investment means, think about it. You can take a loan against your own. Most people don't realize they think of life insurance as being a uh, just, I'm going to die, right? And we're going to get into this in, in the retirement plans and the retirement section later on in uh, I think it's like unit 19 but what happens is is you can actually take a loan because you own that life insurance policy and you can take a loan against it but you don't actually even have to pay back it's, it's considered a loan that you're not responsible to pay back and guess what whatever's left becomes your death penalty your death, death benefit, I'm sorry, your death benefit. So that when it, when you actually do pass away, that still is now your life insurance benefit to the people who, are, who survive you. Now that actually is tax-free. So when you think about that, that's a big difference between tax deferred because what happens with your 401k? When, it, when you start drawing from your 401k. And you have taxes. to pay taxes on it. You're paying taxes on it. Most people have this great thing thinking the 401k is awesome. Why would I want to take my money out of my 401k and move it into another financial instrument? And guess what you can do? You can roll it over from a financial instrument to another financial instrument. So there are different ones which do count. But with a 401k, you're paying taxes when you get it, would you rather pay the taxes up front and buy a life insurance policy? Or would you rather defer those taxes and have no idea what the, the tax rate is and pay the taxes on the full amount of not only what you paid, remember, because you didn't pay taxes, and on what you gained? She can't roll a 401k over into a life insurance policy. No, you can't. But there no. are other, there are other tax, you can't do that one. Actually, <laughs> Actually, ironically enough, there are ways you can just about do that. But well, you, you have, have to, to you pay have to tax it. on it, though. I mean, when you do it, it's some sort. So, 
Well, yeah, there, but there are other okay. instruments you can roll it into that work the same way as a life insurance policy. Okay. But you, you do end up paying some tax on it, but it's a lot less tax than you would uh, the other way. My so, husband's going to have to work for Intel until the day he dies so he doesn't lose his in life insurance policy. There you go. <laughs> there you go. It's that, that uh, company policy. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, so it's considered one of his benefits. So yeah. you will be working until death. Why? Just so when you die, I can collect it. There you go. So, yes, uh, yeah, I, I think that's true for most of us. Actually, th I think most of us will be working until the day we die just because that's the only way we can afford anything. So, but, yeah, with the 1031 exchange, remember that. This is the most important things. It must be declared before the sale of the property, okay, because there's a strict timeline, okay? And within that timeline, you have to identify what the property that you intend to buy, or at least I think it's so many of them that you're considering. Okay. And you must pur purchase them within so many days after that. Okay. And I think the different property types I have to look because I haven't done a 1031 exchange in a while, but it's um, each one has a different number of days based on the different type of property it is. But, uh, They've got a set, a set of guidelines you have to follow, and it must be declared before the sale of the first property, and it must be a like-kind property, and the taxes are deferred, and it's not tax-free. Okay? All right. Now, this is one thing we kind of touched on on Wednesday, but I wanted to go over it again because there were some things in there that weren't really clear. Now, there are two different kinds of things. Now, we're talking about the sale of income now because we're looking for income for a business. Okay, so a lot of times when you get the sale of something, you get the money and it counts as a sale within that year. But what happens now, there's two different kinds. There's a sale of services and there's a sale of items. Okay, but what if those services extend over the tax year? And what happens if you are not purchasing that item um, specifically where it will be used within that tax year? I'll get into that in a minute. But for services, let's talk about that first. Advanced payments for services. Okay. A payment for services, which will be for services which are to occur for longer than the current tax year, um, like a rental agreement for two years or longer, that's what we're talking about here because they'll fall into two tax years. Now, here's what's really cool. Now, this is only for services, okay? And there must be a service agreement, okay? And there's certain conditions for this, all right? It can be claimed in the second year, all right? The people can decide what tax year they're going to claim it. So if it's a service agreement, like a rental agreement, and it's for two years because remember, it's normally when you um, receive the payment, but in this case, you're receiving a payment for a service agreement that extends. They're going to be receiving their services, so they haven't received the full product yet for a full two years, right? Because you're buying the contract. And they're not gonna receive that full contract for that full two years, right? So you can actually, you are allowed to defer the taxes to the second year. But trust me, there are strict guidelines, all right? And we're going to cover them. So when you have services and you want to defer them to the second year, like a rental agreement, and you want to defer the taxes to the second year, there are a couple of things that are really, really important. It cannot be extended. None of the services... You can't do it past that second year. Okay, so if it's a third year, you have to stop the service agreement and start a whole new service agreement. Okay? So if it's a third year, that's it. You can't do any anything for this service agreement um, past that second year. So no activity can go on. Now, here's the other thing. You cannot postpone any of the taxes of the service to be uh, if, any of the, uh, of the service, if any of the service, 
I can't talk right now, is to be performed in the tax year immediately following the second year. So let's say that um, even though your agreement is for just that tax year, you know, for that year, but you say in it, you know, no problem, we'll do everything. Oh, but, you know, two years from now, I'll do that one other thing for you. Okay. None of it can occur in that immediate year past the second year for you to defer it. If you're going to do that, it has to be claimed in the first year. So no activity at all can be performed. You cannot specify in the service agreement any activity to occur as part of that service agreement past that second year. Now, here's the funny part, and I don't know why they put this in here, but this is the way the IRS words it. The taxpayer will perform, will not perform any part of the service at an, un, I forgot, will not perform any part of the service at an unspecified date in the future that may be after the second year. So this means this service agreement, you're going to rent this property for these two years and all this. And then eh, sometime down the road, um, you'll rent this one from me or whatever. Okay. That there's some unspecified date down the road that something else will happen. Okay. You can't have that as part of it. If it is where you're going to defer it, you can't defer it to the second year then. It's all got to occur in the first year. Now, it's kind of redundant the way they put this, but they put it in there literally three times. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that means the IRS is really strict about this. All right, because they actually did put it in there three different ways, pretty much saying the same thing. Don't do anything past the second year. Okay, in simple terms. Don't do anything past the second year. If it's going to be past the second year, you cannot defer it. Okay, pretty simple. If you want to defer it, no problem. Okay, defer the taxes the second year, not a problem. But if anything is going to happen past that second year, you cannot defer it. Okay, even if you say that we don't know when something may happen then. Okay, cannot do that. All right, so nothing past that second year. And again, like I said, the IRS, the way they wrote it up is literally they said it three different ways, the same thing in a sense. So... You can do it if it's longer than two years. You can postpone the taxes to the second year, and that's important for the service agreements, okay? And they're mainly rentals and that sort of thing because you may not want to report it as tax income for this year because maybe you don't want, maybe your income's too high and maybe you only have so much expenses and you want to hopefully put it off for next year when you know you're going to be remodeling some of your units or something like that. So you don't want the income to fall into this tax year. You want it to fall into next tax year based on what you know you have planned. Okay. So you may want to postpone income until the following year. And you can do that, but it has those strict guidelines. Now, advance payments for sales. When do, where can you use advance payments on a sale? Where would you buy something where you wouldn't be using it until possibly the next year. And it would have to be something specific where it has an intended use in the following at a later date. And trust me, I couldn't think of one until I actually read it. Any idea, guys? I can't think of anything. Can't think of anything. I'll be honest. I could not think of anything until I read it and I went through and then I went back and reviewed the tax law itself. And then I found the answer. And it was one item. There's only one type of item that actually qualifies. And it's payments for goods that are generally, payment for goods are generally reported in the year they are purchased, except for gift cards or gift certificates. Think about it when you're buying a gift card. I think I worded that statement wrong. A payment for goods are generally reported in the year they are purchased. And that I should have put, with the exception of 
a possibility of gift cards or gift certificates is what I meant to say. Think about when you buy a gift card, what do you do? You're paying cash at one time with the anticipated use of that cash at a later date. So let's say I did this, and this is actually the example that they were using. I buy a gift card for Tim, and it's December 25th. It's Christmas, right? So I buy that gift card for Tim, and he gets it after you know, I mail it to him. He doesn't even get it until after January, and he gets it and uses it like January 15th. Does he use it? Does he? Re do I report the taxes in the year that I bought it or in the year that he got it? Any ideas? You'd report the paint, the selling of the card the year it was sold, but the goods bought with a card not until the year they were purchased. Now here's here's how it goes. It turns out there's an alternative tax method. If taxation extends, that it's an alternative tax method if it extends over two years. So in other words, if it if it uh, is bought in one year and received and used in a second year. So like a gift card is bought in per in year one and then it's receipt in year two um, and used, a, you know, a, a, like a gift card. Guess what? I get it. There's an alternative tax method, but I more or less get to choose what tax year it will fall into. Okay. Now that one is an exception to it and they brought it up for whatever reason. I'm not sure because I could only think of gift cards after they told me. <laughs> and uh, I don't remember it ever being on the test, on any of the sample tests even. So it's one of those that, yes, maybe you should know that there is, just know that there is an alternative method of taxation, an AMT, if you have a gift card. That is the only one where you would purchase it in tax year one. And if it goes over to the next tax year, and if it's your fiscal year, remember that also counts because that's why I keep saying tax year. Okay. Instead of, instead of uh, just calendar year. Okay. Cause your, your fiscal year could be from, you know, June to June, whatever it is you have established. Okay. For your tax year, but whatever your tax year is, if it goes, it is gifted in year one and the receipt in year two for items such as gift cards. So it's purchased in year one and given and received in year two. All right. So it's it can be in either tax year. There is a special method for calculating what the tax is based on that. And it goes way beyond what you need to know. And if you ever do need to know it, call me and tell me because I don't know of anybody who ever, ever actually has done it that way, but it is available. Okay. Because remember, it's your choice. Most people that I know of would just report it as an expense in that year and not worry about it. Okay. And they're going to get taxed on it in that year for whatever reason. So pretty simple. Don't get too hung up on that, but there is an alternative if the funds will are anticipated to be used in the next tax year. All right, like a gift card. All right, now this is my favorite. As you can see, how many people have a source of passive income? Does anybody you know? Does any, okay, let's start with this way. What is a passive income? Wouldn't you like to do this? Be on the beach with a laptop? No, that, so yeah. when you do investments, like um, you invest in a company, but don't do anything for that company. I'll tell you what, let's look it up. What is... You have an IRA or a 401k that qualifies as a passive income, doesn't it? Well, it's portfolio income, but uh, 
It's really not what's considered passive income. Okay. Okay. So passive income, it's very important. It's income from activities in which the taxpayer does not materially participate. Now, those last two words to the IRS are literally, and I do mean literally, the most important words in that whole definition. Okay, because they've got a whole set of laws as to what it means when I say materially participate. Okay, because they have whole sets of rules. And they, they have wanna... exceptions to those too. I yeah, they, yeah, they do. <laughs> It's crazy. And then when you want to group them together and we don't want to group them together. So, yes, it's kind of like reading a uh, an instruction manual for stereo equipment. <laughs> okay. So, literally, passive income. Now, that's the overall important IRS definition, but let me give you the real world, world definition. A passive income is like buying something, putting some money into something, and each year having more handed back, okay? Rental property is probably the dream passive income for most people because you have a house and you buy the house, you know, have if you know what you're doing, you have somebody fix it up because honest to God, you do not want to do the fix up yourself anymore. You fix it up, turn it into a rental property, make it an Airbnb, and next thing you know, you have a rental income. And as long as you have your a decent property management company, guess what? For a very long time, you could have rental income off of it. Okay? That is passive income. Income from some activity that you really do nothing to get. All right? That you have an initial investment in and each year not just like at a 401k at the end that's the reason it's not really okay but you have an active amount of money coming to you on a regular basis okay so each month you can kind of count on money coming in all right that is awesome okay it gives you the ability. Okay, here are some ideas. What are some passive incomes? Outside of rental property. Well, you know, you, you invest money in a startup and you do nothing at the startup and you just get your your that, money back. That would be possible in a sense. Because you're part owner of a restaurant, like 15% ownership in a restaurant or a business that you don't do anything Something with. Something like that. Those are investment oh. properties that are passive. Yeah, that's true. Stocks. But, but uh, stocks, yes, they can get, they can come up too. But some important ones are things like uh, affiliate okay. marketing. Business. You know what affiliate marketing is? It's a scam. It's, uh, trust me, it's not a scam. With the billions of dollars that come out of affiliate marketing, <laughs> if you know what you're doing, you make a lot of money on it. Uh, because most people think that affiliate marketing, like I said, it's like you said, they, they, they assume it's a scam, but it's actually based on a real market. Oh, the, like banners on your website. Thank you. What ends up happening is a lot of affiliate marketing, they, they started out as a lot of that. But what happens is now people have blogs that are real information. And what they do is they put the links to the items that they're talking about in the blog. Now, what that does is, is that it will then send you, if you click on it, like it'll say, you know, I was just talking about this artwork and here's where I get the paints from, or here's what I was talking about mowing your yard, and here's the, here's the lawnmower I, that I use, or I was baking this cake, and here are the ingredients, and here's where I get them from. Yeah, because when I was researching to do a blog on crocheting, um, most of the, most of the people are saying, well, this is how you set up your blog to make money from your blog. Uh-huh. That's a major one. And the reason is, is because actually it saves people a lot of time if they pay attention. And what it'll do is when you click on that, it'll take you right to the item, but the link itself is set up so that when you go to it, 
the seller is notified that it was you who referred them there. And as a result, you can get a part of the sales. You get 4%, 5% of whatever the sale price was. Guess what happens when you do that over time? If you have a lot of blogs and a lot of followers, guess what? You can be a writer, and that's how a lot of people survive on it. Okay, a lot of writers get their affiliate links, and that's how they make their money. That's how they monetize their sites. Um, when you have, uh, here's, a, here's another one. Now, here's the first one that everybody goes, oh, my God, it's a scam. Anybody know what a multi-level marketing program is? Networking. Networking. Now, here's, here's a funny one for you. Anybody know what the most successful and one of the first multi-level multi -level marketing programs was? Amway. Oh, Amway. Amway. Not even close. Much older than that. And uh, you probably, I'll probably get feedback on this. I'll probably get flack for it when I tell you what it is. But do you know who at the first network marketer was? And one of the best ever, well, actually the best ever in history. Avon? Nope. Now, I'm, I'm going to get flack on this, but the best was Christianity. One man wrote a book, basically, one person being, however you want to put it, wrote a book with a set of guidelines in it, taught it to 12 people. Those 12 people went out and presented it and literally now currently have over a billion people who not only read it, but teach it to other people. Guys, that's what network marketing actually was based on. For those people who don't know that. Christianity was it was a form of network network marketing. They don't like to put it in those terms, but yes, that's exactly what it was. The model it was actually based on Christianity because that's how it spread. Okay, they had a set of rules and a set of guidelines for people to follow, which we now know is the Bible, and it was passed on to all of its followers and everybody in its chain. And as long as they follow it, they can usually be successful at it. And being a pastor, I kind of understand that. But uh, so, yeah, so I understand that. And network marketing, what happens is those people that you show the product, and a lot of people don't understand actually what network, network marketing is. Uh, they assume that because they've heard over history that it's a pyramid scam. There's nothing to do with it because there's there are pyramid scams no matter what. But what you hear about in the news are just those few that are that way. But a lot of products come out that cannot afford major marketing and instead use network marketing. So what they do is is they allow people to market their products and make a product, make make a profit from what they sell and market it to other people and teach them to sell it, and as a result, make a profit or a percentage of what those people who they train. And Amway, as you guys know, is one of the most successful in history for that. Avon, um, Avon was based, is based on the same thing. There are a lot of big companies. Um, oils, healthcare, uh, beauty products, now it's Valentus. <laughs> Valentus, yeah. Global Pharmaceuticals. Kirby vacuum cleaners. Kirby vacuum cleaners. Actually, Rainbow, my grandfather used to do. I, I sold Kirby's when I was 19. <laughs> there you go. So, you know, a lot of people, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, oh my God, it's a scam. It's a pyramid scam. Well, there's a major difference between a pyramid scheme and network marketing you see the major difference is usually with a pyramid scam there is no actual product yeah just cash just cash 
and it's usually a large amount up front. So in other words, yeah, it is for an intangible object, something you can't actually hold, um, like some marketing. You know, you're buying marketing for another person, something you can't actually hold, something intangible, um, because it usually doesn't exist. And it's usually a few thousand dollars to sign up, and you'll get this. And what happens is, if it has a large sign-up fee and an intangible object, yeah, it's probably a scam then. That's what you want to avoid. But the real network marketing ones have a real object, a real product that you can track, and it actually is based upon an actual structure. And the, the other biggest thing is all of them will have a home corporation, the real ones, okay, have a home corporation where the scams don't actually have a home corporation. My mom is falling for some of them, you know, oh, we'll teach you how to, how to make money doing this and you'll make thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. No, don't, don't, uh, don't do it that way. I've been involved in, in, in a few that I know of, but I've, I've been really selective in the ones I get involved in and they're ones that I know the product. That it's not, they're ones that if I, the only way I do them is if I myself use them. So I know they exist. If they're not real products, you know, I don't do any that I don't know the product myself. And if there's something that's really intangible, I don't even touch them. And if I haven't used it and know it, I don't, I don't market it. I have lots of them that I make money off of and I actually teach people how to do it. I have classes on it on how to actually do it. Not to not the you're gonna make thousands and thousands of dollars because honestly you will not make thousands and thousands of dollars. It becomes a passive income. If they're very honest, it becomes a passive income. In other words, you can build up over time. I do honestly know of I have two of my friends who I know who are in my upline, who I personally know, who are worth several million dollars from doing it. I know of one who with Laminine, she is worth over $8 million from doing it. But she actually does a lot of hers overseas in Russia and that sort of thing. So yes, passive income, because it's based upon what her downline is. And, but the difference is she actually spends time with her downline teaching them. Now that's where things come into play here, where the rules for passive income come into play here. So let's start getting into that. Remember, passive income, most important thing. Income from a trade or business activities in which an invest a taxpayer has invested but does not work in. In other words, something that you have invested in but you do not work in it, okay? That's the most important part. What do we got here in the chat room? Oh, okay, Sheila. All right. But passive income is from a trader business activity. That could be lots of things that a taxpayer is invested in, but does not work in, like we were talking about. The affiliate marketing, you put the ad out there and you let it set out there. It may get you an income, it may not. It depends on how many you put out there and if you do it the right way and if you're actually sincere about it. That's a big one too. MLMs, same thing. Do you have a real product and is it really going somewhere or are you just a snake oil salesman? There are always those as well, by the way. Okay, the problem is in the news, the only ones you hear about are the snake oil salesmen. Okay, they don't tell you about all the other ones that are legitimate. Um, other passive incomes is rental properties. Like I said, it's very important. You put an initial investment in it, purchase the house, fix it up, and turn it into an Airbnb. From that point on, and you may not be the person even fixing it up. That may be part of your investment. You may have a contractor that goes out and does the fix-up. After that, you turn it over to your property management company. 
you may have no actual time invested in it. And we'll get into that rental property section in a little bit here because there's an important part of that that's really, really important. Uh, we'll, we'll touch on that. All right. Rental income from properties. Now, this is the important part. Rental income from properties owned by the taxpayer, even if he does actively participate. Now, he can actively work on a property. Now, why is that? Why can he count rental property as passive income, even if he does maintenance and that sort of thing on the property? He's not materially participating. <laughs> Pretty much, in a sense, because that's not his primary job. He's not doing it on a regular basis. He only does like maintenance on the property and that sort of thing. It's not consistent. Unless he's okay. a real estate professional. Thank you. Uh, do you that see thing? that? Do you yeah. see that little except there? <laughs> except for real estate agents. Or it should say actually real estate professionals. Yeah. Um, if you are a real estate professional, guess what? It is no longer um, passive. passive. All right, guys. It's time for the lightning round. Okay? Mm. Are you guys ready? Yes. Let's check your understanding here. I have a question. Are you ready? Everybody got their buzzers ready? Yep. Why are real estate agents not allowed to actively participate in the day to day business of maintaining a rental property and count it as passive income? Answer A It is an active participation in the business. Ah. They can count it as passive income. C Rental income is not passive income. Or D As a real estate professional, property management is part of their active job duties. D. 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 Oh, let's check. And the answer is A, B, C, D. Rental property. What do you think it is, guys? D. D. It is D. As a real estate professional, property management is part of their active job duties. In other words, property management as a real estate professional is you are doing property management. You are expected to maintain a property. Okay, did you like the way that did that? I thought that was good. So, all right. Now, material participation. This is where the law comes into on passive income. And this is very, very important. This is where it separates because it changes what it is between passive income and, and active income. And by the way, they get taxed differently, guys. Remember that. So there we go. It is your material for it to be passive income. Now, this is all to be passive income. You must be active less than 500 hours for the entire activity. Now, what does that mean? That means if it's a project, okay, or whatever it is, overall, for the whole thing, over tax years, so we're not talking about we're not talking about within that tax year. We're talking about, let's say it's over two or three tax years. You can only have participated less than 500 hours. Okay, because the IRS looks at multiple tax years. They don't look at you just your activity within that tax year. Over multiple tax years, you must have been less than 500 hours for the entire activity. Okay. If you were, you must not have been the primary participant of all of the individuals in the activity. Okay, so if there's a bunch of individuals in this activity, like partners is what it's saying, you must not have been the primary partner. So somebody else must have been in charge of it. All right. And this is important when I said 500 hours for the entire activity was less than 100 hours within the tax year. So that 500 hours 
that is spread over a number of tax years. Within any one tax year, it has to be less than 100 hours. If it goes under over 100 hours in a tax year, you're now considered actively uh, participating in it. And if it was included a special service activity in which the taxpayer, it, it, it cannot include, I, I put included, it was not to include a personal service activity in which the taxpayer participated for any of the three preceding years. So in other words, it can't have included a personal service in the preceding three tax years. All right. Now, losses from passive income. Now, this is important because this is actually kind of cool. Turns out the losses from passive income. Now, if I have gains, right, I, I've been money and now I've been losing too. I have my expenses for it and my losses are greater than my gains, I have a loss overall, right? Well, my losses that exceed the income for passive activities are generally disallowed for deductions for the current year, so you can't deduct it, right? It's not considered a deduction for that year. Because how do you have expenses? You have, well, how do you have your loss, right? It's your gains, Minus your losses, you know, minus your expenses equals your profit or loss, right? And you have a loss. So that loss cannot count as a deduction for the current year. Okay, but here's what's cool. You use two different forms. Talk. Taco. You use two different forms. Taco, knock it off. Okay, you use two different forms, form 8582, and that's used to report losses from passive income. The other form is to report credits from passive income. So you have either a gain or a loss from it, right? But here's what's really cool. Losses from a passive income carry over to the next tax year. So let's say this year I've been working on my, my business and I have a loss from it. All right. Those losses then carry over to the next tax year. Okay. So I can use them in the next tax year. So let's say I've been working on my business this year and I had a lot of expenses in this year because I, you know, to initially start it, and I don't have any gains from it. I only have a loss from it. You know, I have, it's my first year getting into this business, and so it cost me $10,000, whatever I put into it. Who knows, right? Your mom invested in it, and you want to shoot her because she basically spent $10,000 to get into this program, and she's only made 50 bucks at it, right? So she has a loss of 9900 and $50, right? So she's got to recover that. So what happens is she cannot go more than that for that year, but the following year she does great at it, okay? And she makes $9,000. Her carryover from the previous year can compensate for those <coughs> But it must have been reported on that form 8582 as a loss from a passive income. Okay? So that's very important. You can carry it over to the next tax year. All right. Now, what about credits? Now, let's say I had a really good year. And the next year, I did poorly. All right. I want to compensate for some of those gains from the previous year on the next year. All right. So I can carry credits over too. All right. And that's reported on the 8582 from passive income. Now, that normally doesn't happen, by the way, with regular income. It's only allowable with passive income. 
That's important. And here's the important thing though. If you sell it, like if it's a rental property and you have losses one year and you have, uh, you are carrying it over, but you sell the property that year, that next year you sell it, in the year that the asset is sold, it's considered fully deductible. Okay, so everything actually is deductible in the year the asset is sold. So at that point, um, it does become deductible. All right, only in the year it's sold, only in the year a passive asset is sold. All right, does that make sense? Anybody following me on that one? I am a little confused yeah. with the form 8582CR. That's only if you have a credit. What happens is that's if you had a gain. So if you want, if you need to carry a gain over to the next year, because you know that what's going to happen is, is you're going to have, um, think about it this way. I have a rental property. Let me, let me do it this way. Um, how can I do this? I know it is not the same as carry back your no. losses. No, 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 this is not. not so, the same. so say one year you make a lot of money on your rental property and the next year you know that you're going to have to make a big loss. Um, repair or something. You want to carry that over because you know you're going to have a loss because of that repair. Um, you want to, and you want to carry that credit over because you don't want to pay taxes on it. Yeah. This year. So, so is that like that? That's exactly it. That is exactly what I was going to show here. This is the rental property in year one. Okay. So what happens is I have rental year one. And I am going, it turned out in this year, I have made, I have a gain of $5,000. It was an awesome year. Whatever year I gained $5,000, right? This is in that first year. So I filed the form, the uh, 8582CR. And report that to carry it over to the next year mm. because what's going to happen is this is that rental property in year two. Okay. Now I would have to, if other words, think about this, what happens if it's going to be just this year and I'm, I want to report I, and I report this money this year, what am I going to pay taxes on? Where's my tax liability? Let's get out our disgusting tax liability circle that we hate. If I am going to do it without reporting it, where's my tax liability? Right there. What's it on? $5,000, right? Yeah. Okay. Now let's do this because we hate our, our tax liability, right? So now we're going to carry that $5,000 gain over to the same property the next year. This is that rental property. Rental. Year two. Okay, but we did this because we knew that this year we were going to remodel it. Uh, okay. We knew we were going to remodel it. Okay, so that was going to cost us uh, $4,800 in remodeling, right? All right, there's $4,800 in remodeling fees. And now, we have for our rents that year, our rent was like, uh, um, we were even, we were break even, we were zero. Okay, because it turned out we hadn't raised our rents, but it was costing us more because it needed to be remodeled, right? So we basically, between these two, we were gonna be in debt we were going to show a loss. So this year we would have ended up showing a loss of $4,800, right? But 
had we done this, we would have paid taxes on this year, but we wouldn't have had any benefit of this loss, right? Because it's a loss. It's not deductible as anything, right? Yes. But if we passed this 5000 as a credit to this year, so we take that gain from this year, and we use this thing to pass it to next year, so it appeared over here. Now we have $5,000 here, and we have a $4,000 in expenses. It's not, it's not really a loss anymore. What is our uh, gain now? What is our loss now? There is no loss. We actually instead gain 200, 200 bucks. So now what are we paying taxes on? This year, we pay. We we have a gain of two hundred bucks. Of two hundred dollars, would you rather pay taxes on five thousand dollars or on two hundred bucks? Two hundred. You got it. Now you understand why you would want to carry that credit over the next tax year. Okay. Because you may know that this next year I'm going to remodel this property. I know about it's going to cost me about this. So no matter what my rents are, I want to offset that. I can offset that with that. I got a big profit this year, so I know, you know I had a big gain this year, so I'll take the money and remodel it, right? Well, I don't want to pay taxes on it here. I want to use it all to remodel it for next year. So I'm going to pass it over as a credit, have it have it as a remodel expense against this gain and i now have a gain of only 200 bucks and now i'm paying tax on this amount irs allowed that mm -hmm. you defer the gain without interest uh-huh because you filed this because you can pass it over uh, on massive okay. income you carry that's over five, that's your carryover for the credit for the next year so again, let's go back to this. Let's go back to our share here on this guy, right? Wherever he went. That one. So that's why with this form, with the form 8582, it's used to report losses. So if we had a loss and we want to carry it over to compensate for Let's say this year we had a very bad year, but it was our very first year, okay? But next year we assume that we're working on it very hard and we're going to have a lot of profit. Do you want to pay for that profit or you can use the, gain, the losses from this year against next year? Same thing. It's just the reverse of what we just did. And the credit one allows you to carry that credit over because you know you're going to remodel the property like we said. So this one, the 8582, allows you to carry losses forward a year, and the 8582CR allows you to carry credits over to the next year. Okay? So those are really important from a passive income because it allows you to move them forward. Now, does that sound cool, especially when you're first starting out with one? You can pass that loss on to the next year because you know you're going to do awesome the next year because you're really working at it, but you had a lot of expenses the first year. You know, you got those MLMs to say, oh, yeah, you're going to make, you know, $5,000 in the first year. You're starting out in November and you're going to make $5,000? Yeah, probably not. You're probably going to have expenses of maybe $5,000. So you have a loss instead. Well, cool. Instead, I know I'm starting to get my clients to come in. I know I'm starting to get things going forward. Hey, you know what? That will care. I'm starting to get people under me, especially. All right. So, guess what? I'm starting to get passive income, but I had five thousand dollars in losses that first year. I don't want to just blow that five thousand dollars in losses off. I want to carry it over to the second year when I know that I've been doing really good and I should have a lot of customers. So, I carry it over to the second year, and it offsets for those gains. That's great. You know, that's, that's great for you. So that's how you would use those two forms to report the losses and carry it over to the next year. In right. form 8582CR, you will declare that you have a plan to remodel next year. That's why no. 
No, you don't. You don't declare anything in the report. You're just reporting an income. You just okay. I, I thought you have to disclose your plan. No, okay. no, you don't have to disclose the plan. You're just saying that you're carrying over a credit from this year to next year. What your intended use for it is up to you. Okay. Okay, you're just indicating that you have a credit to carry forward to the following year. Yes. So, but you don't have so, to specify. Yeah. So, like you know, um, uh, the um, networking, the marketing, um, you would have two different incomes, right? You would have your your active income that would, uh -huh. the thing that you're selling, and then you would have your passive income from the people oh, that oh. you have brought in to do their selling. Correct. If you have, if you've grown that big, yeah, you would separate the two. A lot mm -hmm. of people never get past, you know, their first five people because that's how many people they have in their family that they can talk into it. But so it never matters to them. They don't ever have any profit or loss in that sense. They just only have, you know, they usually just blow it off. But once it becomes a serious passive income, yes, you would separate the two from what you are actively doing. That's your active income because you're participating in the sales of it. Now, there's the other thing, too, and that's what we're going to get into. Are you actively participating in it? Okay, if you have just put up the website and it's just bringing in sales itself and you aren't actively participating in it, guess what? That's still a passive income. Yeah. Okay, but if you are actively, now remember, it's based on the number of hours you put in. You are managing. Yeah, if you are putting in a bunch of hours, you know, each week you're putting in, you know, 20 hours a week, 50 hours a week, whatever you're putting in, then it becomes an active income. Okay, but what comes in from your downline is then your passive income. So, yes, you would separate the two. Or you would just count it all. I don't know why you would want to count it because you can't carry those forward, but you could carry stuff forward from your passive income. And here's the point. It's if you choose to. Remember, you don't even have to carry it forward if you don't want to. But if you choose to, you can carry it forward. I don't see why you wouldn't, but, you know. But, yes, that would, that's how you would do it eventually is once you became large enough, you would separate between your active income and your passive income. So, but yes, that sounds, sounds like you guys are getting it. All right. Now, what is not passive income? And there are certain conditions in it that you have to understand because there's, there's, there's words that go along with it. It's not just to say it's not passive income, but that it's, passive income that uh, is only counted not as passive income because of what goes on with it, how it's used. Because a lot of people say, well, that's passive income. Okay, so what would you think is passive income and what is not passive income? You said a while ago, personal service income. Okay. There's a couple of them here. Well, your Material, materially participate in. Materially participate. That's the most important. And one. I would so. say that um, anything that you materially participate in is not passive income. Correct. But let's let's go into it. There's a couple of special categories, and there's a reason that they are not um, considered passive income. The first one is probably going to get me the most debate on it. But portfolio income is not considered passive income. Okay. Now, why is that? You manage the portfolio. Because you actually usually get dividends from it, that sort of thing. The money is, is paid out not as a passive regular income, but normally as um, a benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay. From when you sell, buy and sell stuff, um, most of those investments are, even though they look like they're a passive income and they feel like they're a passive income, they're really not considered a passive income because you are participating in it not on a, um, how can I put it? You are not getting a regular paycheck from it in a sense. It's when 
you buy and sell the stock or when you buy and sell something in your portfolio. Okay. That's when it's not considered uh, passive income. Now I know that's kind of splitting hairs there. Cause I, I, I know people think, well, portfolio income, that's money coming to me. It's just, it's not really passive income in that sense because it comes to you as a dividend or as a uh, benefit like that. Okay, so it's actually just reported somewhere else to the IRS. The most important thing here is how does it get reported to the IRS? So with portfolio income, it may feel like passive income, but it doesn't come to you as a paycheck. Let's put it that way. If you want to think about it this way, you get a paycheck for both active earned income and for passive income. From a portfolio, you do not get a paycheck. You get a dividend check. So that is kind of the difference there. Okay, do you understand the difference in that sense? Yes. It's really just re it's just really reported differently. It's not really a different thing if you want to think about it that way. So it's taxes, it's not a passive income. It's not taxes, a passive income. Yeah. Okay. Any kind of personal service income. Okay, like assistance and that sort of thing. If you're if you're providing assistance, you're actively doing something. So any type of personal service income is not considered a passive passive income. Okay, anything where you're actively working in it in any sense of the word. Okay. All right. Now this one seems a little strange. Income from intangible property. What does that mean? What's intangible property? Patent, copyright. There you go. A patent. Why is that? I think I've got. I'm getting money from a patent. Why don't I get it? I mean, no, no. come on. Because you materially made it, and then there you go. You got it. Because you are materially involved in the entire patent. You actually participated in the design of the patent, in the construction of the patent. You had everything to do with the patent. So even though you have, um, you're now making money on it, what seems to be passive, the whole project is based upon you. You actually instituted the object itself so you don't get to count it as passive income okay. um but if you bought that if you bought the patent patent um with the money that coming in would that be considered passive income ah she caught something yes if you actually purchase a patent and then lease it now, here's the thing. You're not making all money on the patent. You're making money on the lease. Remember we talked about that there's a difference between um, the item itself and a contract. Okay. Again, you're splitting hairs, but this is how it works. When you are having, when you have a contract, it doesn't count as the object itself. So you're not actually selling the object. You're not actually doing anything like that because you can actually sell it but then it becomes like it's a rental property okay think about it what you're doing i've bought a house and i'm now renting it out you're describing the same thing i buy a patent and now i lease it out to these companies that works as a rental basically it's a lease Okay, so yes, that could be passive income there. Now, granted, you would have to explain it to the IRS agent, and granted, it would be come down to how do I view it. But if you realize that, how can I explain this one? This is going to sound really, really strange to you. But with taxes, it's a matter of perception. Okay. Now, I realize with bookkeeping and whatnot, most people say it's all black and white. <laughs> I don't think there's anything black and white in, in accounting at all or taxes. 
comes down to how you perceive things. And the lines between things as to whether it's allowable or deductible is usually a matter of how you see things. Okay? So if you look at something and it is a... Um, you look at it one way and it's just you're buying a patent and trying to make money off the patent, right? Is that considered passive income? Because you thought of the patent as, as something you were trying to make passive income off of, right? But if you've bought it, you know, but you designed the patent, I'm, I'm sorry, you designed the patent, you are materi materially participating in it. So it's not a passive income. But if you bought the patent and then lease it out again, you didn't materially participate in the patent. So you are now buying it and renting it. So that is the exception. And if you can get that, explain that, and that's the idea, and you can show the trail that you are not the writer of the patent, that you are literally the just purchase the patent for the sole purpose of renting it, then suddenly it becomes passive income, okay? But you have to show that intent, okay? That's, that's the biggest part. Remember on, uh, on Wednesday, we were talking about the gold coins, okay? The U.S. gold coins yes. that were paid as income and their value, because they, again, we were talking about fair market value. And for those people who weren't here, um, we were discussing fair market value. And it's because to the U.S., a $20 U.S. gold coin is $20. Okay. That is its stamped value by the U.S. Treasury. So for means of exchange, a $20 U.S. gold coin is valued at $20. But as we know, a $20 U.S. gold coin is not worth $20. Okay, a U.S. gold coin is like $1,500, so I think it's one troy ounce of gold. So while we see it, while its value is... $20, we perceive its value to be $1,500, right? It's fair market value. So if you go into it again with the intent of it being a $20 coin, you can justify that. And that's, that's why I'm saying it's a matter of what your intent and what your perceived intent was. Because, like I said, and this is the story behind it, and what we'll do is we'll use the, for those people who weren't here, um, we'll go over it again. Because what you're asking is basically the same thing. Um, there was a company that decided it wanted to, it was a smaller company, so and it had a very large profit one year. And it wanted to make sure, and now this is for the people who weren't here, it wanted to, and we're talking millions of dollars in profit, that it didn't want to share the taxes with the IRS. Now, how do you get around paying taxes? Well, there's an easy way for a company. Now, again, a company has to do this. So, like we were saying, this is, and they now have kind of closed this loophole, so you really, it's really hard to do, but you can still, in a sense, get away with it. Um, let's say that as a company, I go buy $10 million worth of $20 U.S. Gold Eagles. Okay, as a company. Now, to that company, that $10 million expense, okay, 
can now will now be $10 million, right? So it'll offsets for its gains. It had $10 million in profit. Let's say it had, you know, $10 million in profit. So it goes out and it buys 10 million. Oh, let me do this again, sorry. So I can show you what this is. So it went out and as an expense, it went out and bought $10 million in gold coins. Now those gold coins are stamped as a $20 US gold coin. And then to its employees paid out their bonuses for the year in gold coins. Their gold coins were based on this $20. And that's their, their profit. So to the IRS, think about this. So it paid out their salaries. In $20 increments, $20 gold coins. So let's say your profit that year was $7,500. That's what we figured it out to be for your share or whatever. So you got, and I can't remember how many gold coins would that be? 20 goes into 7,500 how many times? Anybody got their calculator right in front of them? I do, here we go. Three hundred and seventy-five. Oh, you're awesome. Three hundred and seventy-five gold coins. Now take three hundred and seventy-five and times that by 1,500. This is about $1,500 today. What do you get? 5,000, five, 562,500. 5, I'm sorry? 562,500. Now, for the business, they had $10,000 in profits. And now this is their profit. And before the end of the year, this is their profit. And before the end of the year, they took that profit and bought $10 million in gold coins. They then paid to their employees their bonuses in gold coins. Guess what? Their bonuses were $7,500. What did they get taxed on to the IRS? 7500 mm -hmm. By the way, like I said, for those who were here, it went to court, by the way. And the judge said, guess what? Their salaries were $7,500. So no matter what you want to say it's worth, that's what their bonuses were. It is stamped on their U.S. gold currency, U.S. currency at $20 a coin. So how much was their bonuses? $7,500. So they get taxed on $7,500, right? How much were their actual bonuses? 562500 Thank you. Half a million dollars. I'd call that pretty smart. 
because for a business, what does that $10 million do that they bought in gold coins? As an expense. Offsets their profit. They did it before the end of the year, before their ta end of their tax year. So it offset their profit. So the profit was zero. Cool. That's perfectly legal, isn't it? Everything that happened here is perfectly legal, isn't it? Yes. A company went out and had an expense, bought gold, and then used that raw asset to pay out their currency. And it's stamped right on it. It says on, right on the side of it, U.S. currency, doesn't it? So to the IRS, it is worth what it is stamped on it, right? Yes. So does that make it really hard for the IRS to, or anybody to come back and say, oh, we want you to pay taxes at this amount? Well, why would you pay taxes at that amount? My income is this. I mean, it has this value on it, doesn't it? It says it right on it. So how much was their bonuses? And how much did they get taxed on? They got taxed on $7,500. Their bonus was 562000 approximately, because it'll change. And here's the thing. How many places will not take a gold coin? And it's below the reporting level. It's 1500 bucks. You go into a pawn shop and you sell a gold coin. What happens? Do they report it? No. Should they, in that sense? I mean, should, for the people to legally count this, when they go convert this, because they're going to sell that $20 asset, but it's a $20 coin. They don't necessarily count it as 20 bucks when they go use it. But is it a $20 asset? Not when they sell it. Pretty cool idea, huh? Yep. Except the IRS does follow them around after that and makes sure that they're, you know. But they did, honestly, you know, it, it was an honest way to do it because they, granted, it's not exactly the most kosher. But, you know, hey. Okay, so that's the understanding here. What is your intent? That's what I was, that was the point I was trying to make on this one. What is your intended use? What did not only you use it for, but what was your intended use? And what, how, if you can lay out your reason for doing it that way, because remember, we're going to get into this in the third part primarily is when you are specifying your intent to the IRS, that's where this comes into play. What was the intent of the item? If I go out and I buy work boots and I go climb Mount Hood, do I get to deduct them? No. no. I buy those exact same work boots, but I go wear them to work because I needed them to make sure my feet were safe. Do I get to deduct them? Yes. There you go. What was the intent of the use? Exact same thing. And I'm still wearing them, okay? I'm still doing with them what I needed to do with them. But the question is, what was the intended use? And that's where you start getting into that gray area, okay? So, again, when you said, what if I go buy this and then start renting it, you know, rent it out, give it out, whatever I'm doing with it, is it then passive income? Well, what was your intent? Okay, if you intended to do that, guess what? And you can show that to the IRS that you intended to do that. Does it make it passive income? Yes, it becomes passive income if you can show that it was your intended use to make it passive income. Okay, that's the important part. 
what did you intend? Okay, now that's where it gets gray, and I understand for a lot of people, they're like, well, the IRS isn't, is black and white. No, the IRS is very gray. Okay, so not passive income. Now, again, here's another one for that very first one, portfolio income, how I said. You get paid in dividends, right? Well, you're moving things around. Sometimes it feels like you're not necessarily paid in dividends. And what happens if you then take that investment and you rent it or, or let somebody else use it? Because you can actually sell the contract for even for stocks. It's really interesting how you do that, but it is legal. Suddenly, it's intent. You now have to explain to the IRS, but it becomes a rental situation. You can rent out anything. Okay, let's be honest. Okay, there's nothing you can't rent out. All right. Even a personal service. If you start a personal service and where you are not actively participating in the personal service, it can become a passive income. As long as you can show the intent that it was to be a passive income, that it was not, that you are not actively participating in it in any way. You purchased it as an investment property and it is going in that, in that sense. Okay. So again, this list is kind of arbitrary because it's a matter of what your intent was, not what, you know, the law is not black and white on that. So that you'll always find exceptions, again, to every one of these. But what you want to know is you want to know what's on this list, because this is what the IRS looks at, looks at and what they consider. So to them, to the IRS, and again, this is the IRS, any kind of portfolio income is typically not, and that's why it should say typically not, passive income. All right? Personal service income is not typically passive income. Intangible property, you know, patents and copyrights is typically not passive income because you're usually selling it off to someone else. And you are normally, again, that's where it comes into normally, you were part of the writing of the patent. And that's what they're going from. They're going from that aspect. Um, Tax refunds from a state, local, or foreign tax refund. That's income coming to you, okay? Some people, it's not passive income. It doesn't suddenly appear, and it's not going to appear again. Look at it this way. One of the important parts of this, in a sense, is for it to be passive income, it should be recurring, okay? It should be happening as a regular paycheck. Okay, that's one of the tests for passive income. Um, this one's just thrown in there, trust me. I don't really care so much because I don't think we're going to ever know it. The Alaska Permanent Funds Dividends. Okay, honestly, it's just a special case. It's not a passive income. Congratulations. I think it was a legal case that made it even appear there. And then cancellation of debt income. Now, this is an po important one because people are like, well, um, why is that not a passive income and why can't I carry it on to next year and why can't I? Because it is not anything you did to get it. Okay, you didn't actively do anything to get this. This is basically a debt you owed and somebody is giving you the funds. They're basically canceling it and being very nice to you. But you're still responsible for that as being considered income and we will cover cancellation of debt here. Hang on. So, we're basically out of passive income. We now know more about passive income than most people. So let's take, let's tell you what, what time is it here? It is, oh, uh, sorry, 1227. 12 let's take about a 15 minute break. Let's come back at 1245. Okay. Okay, let's take a break so I can go check okay. on why my dog is driving me nuts. Because I'm hearing my doorbell ring and I'm ignoring it. So, um, 
Let's come back in about 12:45. All right? Right. Okay. okay. I'm back. I'm here. All right. It turns out it was my mom's nurses showing up. So that was what I was doing. So, how's she doing? She is doing much better. You know, I mean, she's in a wheelchair, but she has skin grafts on her legs and things like that. You know, from wounds she's developed over the years. Oh, boy. But they're healing. So that's good. So, all right, let's get to this. Um, there was one term that I forgot that is probably, you know, since we've been talking about business assets, you know, business income, and uh, we've been talking about, you know, passive income, that sort of thing. But there was one type that I didn't discuss that I probably should have brought up. So I threw it in here because it's really important. <laughs> it's called ordinary income. We keep overlooking what basically ordinary income is. We were discussing you know, passive income and uh, uh, what dividends are, you know, earnings, things like that. But ordinary income is income that is subject to regular tax. Um, now, this is opposed to long-term gain. Okay, the difference is long-term gain is usually at a fixed rate. Now, when you think about it, You've got two types of income that are normally coming into you outside of passive income and that sort of thing. 
you have normally income from something you sell, you know, ver, you know, like a house, you have a capital gain on it, or you have a W-2 income when you think about it that way. Capital gain on a house is usually at a fixed rate. Okay, estates, things like that, are all a capital gain tax. Anybody know what the rate is basically on a capital gain? Nope. Anybody know? Capital gain tax? It's usually 15%. So it's pretty much a fixed rate. Okay. And the reason is it's not something that you are going to get over time. It's something you got out of the sale of your house or sale out of uh, uh, sale of uh, a property or something like that. If you're a business, it's sale of your assets. Okay, um, this is where that that uh, patent would come in. If you sold the patent and you made profit on the sale of the patent, that would be a capital gain. Then, so anything that you had a capital gain on is taxed differently than good old-fashioned ordinary income. Okay. Ordinary income for a business. Okay, let's let's go this way. What is ordinary income for an individual? Their W-2. W-2. That's ordinary income for a person. W-2, 1099, however it came to you. Okay. Self-employment income. Self-employment income. There you go. All right. Perfect. So... But for a business, it's anything coming into it from its activities. All so right. sales? Sales. Um, typically sales, manufacturing of its products, its services, sale of its services, um, anything of that nature. Okay. However they're making their funds, that is what their income is from. Now, out of that income, some of it can be passive and some of it can be active, okay? But the passive is handled differently than the regular income. And that's why I said there's ordinary income. And that's one of the things that I was, that I kind of overlooked when I was uh, putting everything in here is I overlooked a good old fashioned, old fashioned definition of ordinary income. And that is just income that you're paying good old fashioned regular taxes on. All right. So everybody kind of clear on that one. Cause I wanted to clear that up a little bit. Cause I realized I hadn't mentioned that to anybody. Yeah. Okay. It's yes. uh, initially it's a Friday, man. Everybody and their brothers coming here. <laughs> so, but Ordinary taxes, uh, ordinary income is just everything that you would be adding up as your regular paycheck, uh, whether you're a business or whether you're a person, it's just your regular everyday stuff that's coming in. All right, so that's your ordinary income. All right, now let's go back to this. Grouping activities. Now, when we were grouping activities, now this is kind of why I wanted to bring up the ordinary income. Now, we've had passive income. Um, we've had ordinary income, and the primary difference between the two is what? Between passive and basically ordinary income, what's the major difference? Uh, I have an activity in the uh, material activity in the in the business. In the business, if I actually actively did something with it, if I was actually um, working in it, it is ordinary income. It is my active duty income. It's my ordinary income. But if it's passive income, it's income that occurred from an initial activity I started or an investment I made, and I am now getting reaping the benefits of it long after that activity is over with. And it has certain requirements. Like I said, it has to be less than 500 hours for the overall project. And um, it has to be less than 100 hours within a single tax year. And, you know, those are some, you know, and I cannot be the primary person on it. 
In other words, you know, if there's a if there's an active amount of things in it. So a rental property, what does that well no, okay, rental property you can unless you are what? A real estate one, agent. A real estate agent, a real estate professional. Uh, because <laughs> that is part of their regular job duties. Okay. But if there is any project that I do a little bit on and then just get the profits from somebody else has got to handle it okay i cannot be the primary person on it i cannot be the primary individual it's got to be an activity that somebody else does or something else has to occur that i'm not in charge of that i'm just making income off of normally investments if you want to think about it that way it's normally an investment i made that is coming to me in a passive way Okay, but we also know that stocks and that sort of thing are going to come in to me as a dividend. And they're coming at specified times, normally not from, uh, not as a regular paycheck. Okay, it's got to be something that's basically recurring and that, um, I, know, I know the argument is, well, sales don't always occur. Sales are kind of, even though they're recurring, just not on a, set schedule rents occurred normally on a set schedule sales same basic thing you just aren't occurring on it. then they have ups and downs but yes they do kind of occur you're expecting re repeat business let's put it that way okay so what would happen is you want to group certain activities why would you want to do this What would be the benefit of grouping activities for tax purposes? Offsetting gain with loss. Thank you. I knew you'd get it, Sheila. I knew that. that was awesome. Because a lot of times you have gain from one activity and loss from another. And what you're looking to do is offset them. So you want to group them together so that their gains and losses will be zero. So their overall profit will be zero. Okay, but again, naturally, what does that mean? Grouping business activities is going to have what? It's going to have rules. Okay, so what's the most important rule when you're trying to group a business activity? They got to be groupable. They must be similar activities or the taxpayer must show material participation in at least one activity. So I know that sounds strange, but it means that they have to be similar, so you can't have um, to rent to to, to mix your rentals with some financial one over here. Okay, your losses from your from your uh, financial activities and your rental income over here cannot be combined. They are unrelated activities. So if I've got sales, for example, and I'm selling for two different companies, that could be grouped together. That could be grouped together. They're both sales activities. Okay. So what happens is they have to be similar activities. So in other words, they have to be something. And again, remember where I said everything is perception. Okay. So if you can show of a, a perceivable link, then it may be accepted as a perceivable link, okay, <laughs> by the IRS. Remember, you're, that's who you're convincing here. You have to convince these that the people on the other side of this, that yes, it does make sense for you to do what you did. Okay, so when you are grouping business activities, it has to be in a grouping in such a way that you can see the logic behind the grouping. Now, Sheila just said it. I took two sales, two sales activities. They're both sales from different companies, different products, and combine them. And the gains from one offset the losses from another. That's perfect. And the reason is they have a commonality of the sales. All right. Well, there are also still commonalities between un, unrelated activities. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to find where those commonalities are. So if you have sales in one area and you 
uh, have another financial act, financial one. And, you know, I'm not trying to think of one where you could, where they're unrelated, but as long as you can justify the link between the two, um, like in a financial one, if you are, um, I guess if you could try to justify it as you are selling financial instruments, but not really, there's, you have to have been doing insurance or something like that where it's financial and you were selling it. But uh, in most cases, you know, like I said, let's, let's keep it out of the exceptions here because I, 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 the test isn't going to be looking for that many exceptions. But similar activities, so as long as they are related in some way where it's fairly obvious that they're related, because again, it is perception, then you can group them together. Okay, sales is one. What else, can you, what, what else could you group together? Now remember, passive activities and, and active activities can be combined. So what could this be? Okay, here's a strange one. I have a guy that I know of who actually owns several car replaces, car repair places. He rents them out. He actively has one too. He's a mechanic. Okay. Well, sometimes he has losses as a mechanic, which is rare, but he always basically has rental income from those other places that he's renting out. Now, he can group them. Do you want to know why? And it's been justified to the IRS, and they agreed. Do you want to know why? Did you guys guess? A related activity. Thank you, in a sense, but what activity? It's not a related. I mean, one is... One is repairing cars and one is renting out properties. Because the commonality is the, the auto repair industry. Aha, thank you. You got it, girl. That was awesome of you. He related it based on the fact not that what they were doing, but what they were. Okay. They're all related to the auto industry. Okay, they're not doing the same thing. One is he's renting these auto auto repair body or these auto body repair shops and auto repair shops um, out to other places. He owns them. That's his hobby is basically buying them up because he knows what to look for. He's a mechanic. Okay, so he buys them up and he rents them out to other mechanics to use. And guess what? He also is a mechanic. So he works as a mechanic. And as a result, you can group the rentals with those with the fact that he is a mechanic and those, those activities for the reason that they fall under the same type of property, the same type of industry. Okay? Where he's working is basically one of those shops. Okay, so if you can find a commonality, that's the most important thing. And I, I can't stress that enough. A lot of times, what will be the difference between something being rejected and something being accepted is not what it says in the book. Okay, because the book will specify it is supposed to be this. Okay, well, here's what I've got. It doesn't quite fit the rule. Well, then you have to realize this is what I'm doing because perception is it should work. You've told me that I can rent, that I can combine these activities, you know, because it says in the IRS book that you can do these, but it must meet these criteria. Well, I have a criteria why they're a commonality. They're all in the auto industry. My repair shop is literally one of those repair shops. So again, perception is literally everything. Okay? So, grouping activities. And if you can offset 
Remember, you may be very good at one and it may be a startup year for you for another. So you may have what from the passive activity? Let's say that passive activity is a startup for that year. You know, you had an outlet, you may, you have a loss because you had a massive startup that year. Okay. And now you have a loss and I've got, I can, I've got a, oh, that's like, okay, that's terrible. I have a loss. Do I want to take a loss for the company? Well, actually that loss can be great. You know why? Because if I can show that activity is related to another activity where I have a great profit that year, guess what? I can offset that profit. Okay. So relating the activities between uh, one of your passive activities and one of your, um, uh, or one or more, because it doesn't have to be just one, but they must be similar activities in some way. That's one of the things about the IRS code is it doesn't specify what that some way is. Okay. All right. Now that's grouping and Sheila got it. The best reason is you're trying to group them because you want a gain of one to offset the loss of another or the loss of one to offset the gain of another, more importantly. All right. This is one of my favorites. Who here has a rental property? Anybody? Anybody have a rental property? No, but we were thinking about getting into rentals. Don't. <laughs> It's nothing but a headache. It's one of the best things you can ever get into. You just have to know how to do it. I had, I had tenants from hell. Oh, yeah. Well, you have to know how to screen tenants, too. That's one of the important things. Um, the important things are this. Rental properties, there are, and besides, there are, there are different ways to look at rental properties, too, because you see how you are and how you rent them are different things because if you, what you have next to it is important because a lot of people don't realize that there are multiple ways to rent out a house. Okay. If you have a hospital near you and they have the, all hospitals have um, patients, which are on that border between going home and, uh, still needing hospital care, but they can't, they can't justify keeping them in the hospital. Well, a lot of those people for short-term rental would love to have a property, be part of a property that's set up next to them. You can set up a home that's basically an assisted living home where the doctor is near the hospital and they can come visit them once a week or whatever. And you're setting that home up. What happens when you run out those three bedrooms? Do you know how much rent you can get off of that single home? those bedrooms would basically run for $2,000 a month because it's basically an assisted living. Better not be zoned R1. Well, it depends on how you look at it. And it's also, it depends on what state you do it in. <clears throat> and it depends on how you classify it too. So what ends up happening is, is you can rent out bedrooms because any, any place can be basically used as a boarding house. So um, you can go in and use those bedrooms, each one as an individual bed for a patient for care that the patient's paying for anyways. And the doctor can come, come visit them. And your rent just went from what? Probably about 1500 that you normally would have gotten to $5,000, $6,000 a month. Also, what happens if there's a college near you? It's called the pizza effect. If there's a college next to you, how long is the, the school year? It's normally September to June, right? Now, what dad will not pay for his daughter to be a whole lot more secure in a private residence, okay, renting out a single bedroom for a fully furnished house for a single bedroom at $1,000 a month versus, you know, phone service, ca cable there, and in the lease agreement, you specify that the contact person for any activity for the tenant is the father you don't specify it's the daughter and they're the 18 you know 18 year old daughter who's going to have parties okay and so the contact person for all activities for the tenant is the father so guess what happens that very first time she decides to throw a wild party and the cops are are called guess who gets called 
the dad. You think it'll ever happen again? And you're getting $1,000 a month. Because if the dad's got to drive out, and in the, in the lease, you can specify anything you want, that the contact point is at the rental property. You got to know how to do these things. Depends on how you write up the lease. So yeah, rental properties become a dream. And so what happens is, is if you have houses next to a college, think about that. One house, three properties, that's three thousand uh, dollars. You know, I mean, a three-bedroom house. You rent it out to three girls, three different girls, each one to with a different lease for their particular bedroom for a fur, fully furnished house. Oh, that's three thousand dollars a month. Hmm, that's better than the fifteen hundred dollars you would have gotten normally, wouldn't it? And it's only basically occupied for three months, for nine months out of the year. Hmm, that's pretty good. Turn it into an Airbnb over the summer. Hmm, and then it becomes even more. What happens when you get that other property down by the coast and you immediately just turn it into an Airbnb and you have the property management company service most of it? So most of the time, um, they're going in, servicing it, changing the sheets, doing everything out in between, and you run it through the Airbnb app and it's being rented when it needs to be, especially depending upon its location. And then it becomes down to, remember that perception? How do you rent it out? Do you say, hey, I've got a farmhouse out here in the middle of a field. Do you want to rent it? No, it's a secluded a secluded farm. Allow you to get that peace, relaxation that you have wanted for years. Yeah, it becomes different then all of a sudden. Depends on your marketing and how you do it. So, rental properties. Let's go to what it means income-wise. Rental properties have an expense. They have an initial purchase price. So, you immediately have a mortgage. So, it has expenses. It has maintenance. It has initially not only the purchase, but usually in some cases fixing up, depending on what you're going to have to do to it, its current condition. It has marketing. And then its income is its rental. Okay. So they become a whole lot different than a normal than a normal property because they normally have everything all wrapped in one. So has anybody actually dealt with rental properties before? I mean I have. So unfortunately. So what kind of an experience have you had with it? What's been what's been the Well, I, I moved here. Uh, from the East Coast, and I rented my house out mm -hmm. for a while, and um, it was uh, not pleasant. Let's put it that way. Where'd you rent it out? I had a rental uh, manager. No, and, where? Uh, what? Where? Strasburg, Pennsylvania. Ah, okay. Now, what are the landlord laws in Pennsylvania? Oh, they're pretty stiff. You cannot have more than three people in the house that are unrelated. And uh -huh. You can't have an Airbnb. You can't. Uh -huh. uh, oh, so, no, I, well, it, it, they're numerous. So you've learned the problem of rentals. You need to know what the state laws are for a rental property. Do you know what the state laws are in Oregon? No. Do, you know what the, do you know what the laws are in Washington especially? See, the state laws in Oregon never have a rental in Oregon, ever. See, the reason is in Oregon, all the laws favor the renter. The renter can literally get into a house and stay in there for the next two years until you can get them out. Get it? Because, oh, they, because what happens is in Oregon, they have the ability to argue it and postpone it. In other words, it... Uh, is an ongoing court case. They actually become, they, they consider this poor housing situation where there's a tenant in there who now will be possibly homeless if they're evicted. Of course, they don't consider the landlord's income or anything else. The fact that they're going to be foreclosed on very soon. You know, kind of thing. But Oregon doesn't care. Okay. Washington, on the other hand, is probably the greatest state ever for rental properties because it's real easy how it works in Washington. 
Washington, most of the laws favor um, the activities of the landlord. In other words, you can rent the property for what you want. The tenants can use it for multiple people. They don't have to be anything related or anything like that. They can be however they like to be. You can use it for Airbnbs and that sort of thing. And by the way, even the state laws to not, not use it as an Airbnb is something they cannot try to dictate because they can't determine that your income can be controlled by the state. So that one's been argued. But the thing is, in Washington, if a tenant is not paid their rent or has violated the lease in any way, what you do is you go down to the county courthouse and you file an eviction notice. And there's a whole series of notices that you have to send to them to correct it first. Um, the notices have to go out on specific dates and they have to be mailed and they have to be certified and they have to be put on the property. And there's a whole series of things as long as it occurs because you did not, the tenant has broken the lease in any way or not paid their rent. As long as you follow the specific date steps on basically the 11th day of the month, you go down to the county courthouse and you file with the county court saying that I'm evicting this person for this purpose. And it's a little form and you file it and it then gets on the docket and a notice is sent out by the court to the to the property and it has to have them uh, well on your eviction notice it has to have the property address and the con all the contact information you have about the tenant and the violation and and what the conditions are and then on that date they have a court you go to court and you appear before the judge and if you're the landlord you go here's the situation and if the person doesn't show up it's defaulted and if the person does show up, they have to make their justification as to why they're still in it and what they have done, or why this is not a valid claim, like they believe the rent has been paid, do you have the receipts, you know, or anything showing that you've paid the rent. And the judge will make a determination at that time. It's not a it's not a ongoing thing. The judge makes the determination of the eviction at that time. And if you are in violation, the eviction is effective immediately. And that next day, it's basically 24 hours to get out, okay? Uh, 24 hours later, he usually puts it at 12 o'clock the next afternoon. The sheriff comes with the notice, knocks on the door, and you are toast. You are out. And that is how Washington works. So it depends upon what your state laws are. It has nothing to do with what the rental properties are, it has nothing to do with anything else. You have to know what your tenant laws are for each particular state. Because if you know what the landlord laws are, then it matters there. So yeah, in Oregon, you can stay in there for just about ever. Because they don't want people to be homeless on the streets, is the theory behind it. In Washington, it's pretty straightforward. The landlords have a property, they're trying to maintain their property. And if a tenant is not paid it or is having parties all the time and has had the police call multiple times and if it's a violation in the lease, then you're out. And the sheriff shows up the next day and you're out. Now, here's a question. What happens when they beat the property up because they're being evicted? What happens? You can take them to court, but... You know, if yeah. they don't have any money, you're not going to get any. Why would you ever take them to court? <clears throat> ever? For, for damages. Why would you ever take them to court? What kind of First, a landlord? Uh, security why would, lawsuit, why, right? why, would you, why would anybody, why would any landlord ever take a tenant to court over damages to a property? What does he have? What is he? An excessive security deposit. He is, he is basically, the, and there is vandalism uh, insurance for landlords that you, ha that you can get that covers exactly what we're talking about. And no, I'm not talking about vandalism. I'm talking about stuff that they shouldn't have done that they did that was, is not necessarily normal wear and tear. This includes basically destroying the walls. Um, holes in the walls, tearing up the floors. Short of burning it down, then it falls into a different category. 
Yeah, that's vandalism. Uh huh. That's vandalism. And what happens is there's special landlord tenant insurance that what will you would get, and I would never have a property without it, that covers damage inflicted to a property by a tenant outside of normal wear and tear. And so what happens is, and yes, there is a deductible on it and everything else, but what happens when they come in and destroy the walls and the thing like this, then you pick up the phone, you call your contractor, and you say, okay, here you go, Charlie. Um, the check will be here as soon as the insurance clears. Okay, go fix it. And he goes over and he patches it up, does what he needs to do, and guess what? The insurance then sends the check to it for the repairs. Why would you ever take a tenant to court? Tenant's not going to pay anything. They don't have any money. They'd pay rent. That's what insurance is for, guys. Okay? And that's why, as a tenant, uh, as a landlord, if you know these things, being a landlord is easy. Okay? It's one of the easiest things in the world. You just have to know the landlord laws and you have to know the things that are in place for landlords <clears throat> because they're there for to protect you it's your property it's your asset are you not going to protect it okay there's insurance to cover that okay and that's I've got insurance and it is insured yeah but there's normal homeowners insurance that you would have but then there's also landlord vandalism insurance that covers these things that you would get specifically for this type of thing it's in addition to the normal homeowner's policy. It's not part of the homeowner's policy. And you would put it on there, and it's for non-owner-occupied properties, and you would have to get it specifically for it. And then what happens is when they damage it, guess what? It gets repaired, and you go on to the next one. And they've lost their security deposit. So, okay, we're good. So... You use the security deposit to pay the deductible. There you go. So when it comes down to it, it's not that difficult. You just have to, I guess when, it come, it, when you've done it enough times, it becomes secondary. It's not a, it's not a hassle anymore. And it, it's a hassle when you have that one property and it's your first property and you've had that bad tenant and you go, I never want to be a landlord again. Okay. It becomes secondary when you've done it a hundred times and, or you've managed properties for a lot of times and realize that that's a cost of doing business. What happens to those, those things? Okay. Let's say they damage the property, right? What is that? They damage the property. It costs you to fix it, right? It's an expense. Thank you. It's a business expense. Goes off against those profits you've been making from the rental. And here's the thing. If your rental rates are not enough to be covering that, then you made a mistake. And you need to have your rents higher than what it was. Now, if it's not going to rent for that amount... Here's a question on real estate. When do you make your profit? On real estate? When you sell? Nope. If you're an investor on real estate, when do you make your profit? When you sell it, right? Nope. <laughs> All your profit is determined when you first buy it. If you bought it too high or bought it too low, you're already you're already at a loss. Ah, uh, when the value appreciates. It doesn't make any difference. You'd better hold on to it for a very long time if you hope to appreciate it past what you may have lost. And then on top of it, you're praying that the market stays where it goes. So now, they're going to tell you that that's not the truth, that it's when you sell it. It's not. It's when you buy a property is what determines if a property is a an actual um, profit or loss is when you buy the property. Okay? If you bought it too high, guess what? It's not going to ever be a rental property, no matter what. 
no matter what you do to it. You made the mistake of getting into it, especially if you buy a property and you think, oh, I'll fix this up and I'll get these rents. You have to know the rents beforehand. Okay? You have to know your stuff beforehand. Otherwise, don't do this. You have to know what it's going to rent for even once it's, once it's fixed up. You have to guess these things. So a rental property... Now, Sheila, I understand in your case, you were renting up, renting out your your house when you moved out here. Right. You pretty much didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. The market okay. was horrible. Okay. You had a property back there that you could not rent out, I'm sure, for <clears throat> more than the property was worth because it was your house. Right? Mm-hmm. So the best you could hope for is probably break even. All right? Or just above, maybe. Yeah, and pretty much break even. So break even. So at the first time the, the tenants do something, um, it's going to cost you, or you'd better hope to, that you knew about the insurance to cover it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, I'll call my insurance carrier today and ask them about my insurance and if it covers it, because yeah. it is specifically for rental. Right. But there is there is insurance specific to vandalism. And it's an add-on rider that you normally have to get to your insurance policy. And it depends upon the insurance company, too. Some of them don't offer it. Mm -hmm. and some of them you have to actually contact specific insurance companies that do carry that. And what will happen is it will cover if somebody vandalizes your property. And by vandalizes, it means the tenant or somebody from the outside destroys part of your property. Now, there's usually a general deductible, and the general deductible is usually a good grand, okay? No, let's not kid ourselves. It's usually a thousand bucks or something, but usually their security deposit will cover that. Now, here's the question. Rental income. The rental amount, what is that considered? The rent that you're getting each month. When do you report it, and when do you... Well, you reported at the end of the year. You got it. Now, here's one next question. When they first rented the property, they gave you a security deposit. Yeah. Yes. What is that? Liability. That's not income. Not income. It's liability like any deposit would be. There you go. There you go. It's a liability. It's sitting there because you're going to give it back. Okay. At least that's the intent is to give it back. Or right. you're holding on to it. Because now, how do you have to hold on to it? Here's a big one. How Put it into a trust. There you go. I in trust. It has to go into an account specifically as a security account. So you can't just go spend it and then pay it back to them later on. It depends how many properties you have. And it depends yeah. on what state it is. True. Very true. But most people, um, especially when they have one rental property, um, like it's just one house they have rented. Guess what they usually do with the security deposit? Probably putting <laughs> put it in the bank. They immediately put it into their checking account. They go, oh, okay, yeah, I got your security deposit. That's cool. So rent this out. Okay, we're good. And what ends up happening? They spend it. They don't have no idea what a rental, to, what a security deposit actually is. In that sense. You can't do that in Oregon. They would get your They butt. would nail you like crazy. That's why I said. Being in um, Pennsylvania, you have to have more than nine properties in order to have a separate uh, account that has the... Uh, uh, the, the separate rental. Yeah. Yeah. The security deposit has to be uh, uh, non-commingled for that matter. Yes. Right. But... Uh, Overall, that's one of the important things. Rental property income, you can, in a sense, because if you're a single person, sole proprietor, you can commingle it. Okay? You should not. And if you do it in certain states, because it, it goes on your state law, and you are right, if you do that in Oregon, they will probably crucify you. Um. Uh, being a landlord in Oregon is one of the toughest states to do it because they really do. Uh, the tenant has literally all uh, all control in the state of Oregon. Okay. And you cannot get them out. But 
once it comes to you, the rental properties, okay, the income from it. Let's get back to that. The income from it, once you are now from your personal house, can you deduct you can deduct what? Mortgage interest? Yes. Yeah. And taxes. Okay. And taxes. Okay. Can you do that from a regular rental property? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, how do you do it? It's Schedule E. There you go. Okay. It's put on there as an expense. So yes, all of them in a rental property, everything is deductible in a rental property. All expenses are deductible, okay? Even if it's just a secondary house, okay? So what happens is, is you um, track everything and it has to be specified as an expense and all of the rent amount is considered the income. Now, what about maintenance, the amount you're specifying to put into an account as maintenance, what is it considered? Like, you know, let's say your rents are $1,600 a month, um, $1,400 a month is what you figured is going to be um, what you had as, you know, your mortgage and everything else, leaving you $200 a month and you were going to put 100 of that to you and a hundred of that just into an account for maintenance. What is that hundred amount that do you put away to maintenance? What's that considered? I mean, you're saving it. Oh, you're saving it, yeah. So it's an asset. It becomes an asset itself. Okay, so you count it as basically income into the property, but it's offset as an, uh, as an asset, on, as a liability on the asset side, right? Offset is a liability. I mean, uh, offset, uh, offset is a, uh, you're offsetting the income um, by saying it's an asset on the other side. Okay, um, I'm not quite getting where you're going with that one. Well, no, I mean the $100, you're showing it as an asset, so you're accounting for it there. You're right. counting for it as an asset is what I'm saying. Okay. So even though it came in as income, you're showing it as an asset. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. You're setting aside for maintenance. For maintenance and that sort of thing. Because let's say that something happens, the water tank breaks. Uh, okay. Something happens that you have an unexpected um, emergency at the property. The roof starts leaking and you have to pay for um, a section of the roof. Okay. And what's happening is, is, out of the rent that you're getting, $1,600, okay, $1,400 covered the mortgage and all the regular expenses, okay, so you have $200 left, okay, you take $100 yourself as your income from the property, right, as the business, you take the $100 to you, but there's another $100 that what you're doing is, is you're putting it into an account in case something happens. In other words, it's a a an emergency fund if you want to think about it this way so each month it's building up a hundred dollars a month so you end up at the end of the year with like twelve hundred dollars okay that fund is there to cover you in case something happens the roof leaks the water tank uh, the water heater um, starts leaking and you have to replace it it falls apart the air conditioning stops working the uh, whatever it may be okay Whatever happens, that's what that you're building up that fund for. On your balance sheet, on your on your sheet, you would show it as an asset because you're keeping it. That's how you offset it from the income that you came in, how you track where it went. You track it now as an asset to show that it was brought in and you're holding it as an asset in case something happens. So you would track as an asset from that point forward. Okay, do you understand that? Yeah. I think I'm saying I think I'm saying it right that way. It sounded better the second time I said it. Yes. It sounded better in my head the first time. Um, but yes, that's what I was trying to say is you would track it as an asset after that. Because it came in as an income, but you're tracking it now as an asset because you're now holding on to it in case something happens. Okay. All right. Now 
when you sell the property, what would it count as typically? Let's say you just sold it outright. All the money you made at it. Let's say there's a, there's a gain. There's a big. What's it going to count as for? Doesn't matter if you're a business. Doesn't matter if you're a person. A capital gain. Yes, it's typically a capital gain. So what's important about a capital gain versus regular capital ordinary gains income? Tax. It's at a fixed rate. It's usually right. fifteen point five percent. Fifteen percent. Fifteen point five percent. I have to look. Fifteen percent. So it varies slightly per year. So, anyways, so it is at a fixed rate. So it's not ordinary income, right? It's not a regular paycheck. The rent would be ordinary income. Okay, but if it's sold off, it falls under everything you're making there is capital gains. All right, so that's the classifications. Capital gains, ordinary income, and passive income. Those are the three. Okay, capital gains and ordinary income are almost the same thing. They're just taxed at a different rate and where they came from, based on where they come from. Are you gonna get into depreciation and de depreciation recapture? Yes, yes I will, and that one's a big one. That one's all of, basically all of, I think, chapter seven. So depreciation and uh, amortization. So, all right, now, rental income, wow. that's pretty much everything you would need to know in regards to rental income for a business, because most of them are not, most companies, unless it's specifically a, a uh, business that is directly related to rental income, do not typically have a bunch of rental properties. Most businesses do not rent out properties unless they are specifically a rental property. You know, most, most, uh, <laughs> very few auto mechanics own rental properties. One does that I know, but all right. I did not fit on the screen. Investment income. What does it count as? You know, what is it? What does That's it usually count? It's, it does count as that, but it's a dividend. So it really isn't, in that sense, is not counted, unfortunately, as passive income. It's considered as a dividend. Now, the investment, it, it if, okay, oh, let, me, let me rephrase that. It is passive income if it's not, if it's paid out as a regular recurring payment to you, okay? If it's a regular, if it's a dividend payment, like stocks, that sort of thing, then it's not passive, it's an investment income from a portfolio, okay? Do you understand the difference? The difference is how it gets paid to you, okay? Because one is you are basically actively trading stocks and you don't get your money um, until you sell the stock, okay? You're buying a stock and you sell the stock, all right? That takes an active um, nature to it, if you want to think about it that way, okay? When you buy a stock and sell a stock, that's when you make it with a stock. Um, with an investment income, it's more when you are investing in something, you expect a regular return on it for it to be passive. All right, so in other words, I give somebody, uh, I invest in your company, you make widgets, and I'm giving you, uh, you know, Tim is a friend of mine, all right, I'm going to give him $10,000 to help him make his widgets, all right, in return, yeah, I probably get maybe 500 bucks a week out of the sales. I don't have any active role in it, but I'm really not investing in that sense. In a sense, I'm a partner. You're a silent partner. You're a silent partner. Okay. But that is basically passive income. Well, sure, because you're a silent partner. I'm a silent partner. And that's the key. Do I get a regular paycheck? You got it. Oh. Well, I, I get I get something regular from them, not just at the end of 
the sale or just as a dividend. I get some type of return on my investment, typically on a regular basis from him. It's not a scheduled thing where I'm getting dividends. If I get a dividend check from the company, those are stocks, okay? Those are investments in companies that I have invested in, and that is not considered passive, that's not considered passive income, okay? That's considered an investment that I get a dividend check. The difference is, is how I get paid. Okay, do you understand that one difference? I know it sounds confusing. Again, please. <laughs> but it I will write. Okay, let's how, make note. Yeah. How you get paid determines the difference between if it's a stock investment or if it's actually like a business investment. Okay. How you get paid if through dividends. If it's through a dividend then it's not really a passive income, it's a dividend payment. That's a capital gain. And that's considered a capital gain. That's the difference. But it's basically what, if it's a capital gain, it's not passive income. Right. If, if, it, if it's something where you have no activity and you can look at it, Look at it this way. If I was actively working in it, I'd get ordinary an ordinary paycheck. If I'm getting a paycheck from it, but I'm not actively working in it, that's passive. If I'm getting a check from it as a dividend check that gets paid by, it gets looked at like a capital gain, that's a dividend. That's a non-passive income. Okay? The difference between the two is can I work in it? Okay, that would be it. I guess that would be the question. Can I work in it? Can I work in those stocks? Can I go to work? Can I, can I pick up that day and decide, you know, today I know that normally my income is passive income, but today I think I really want to get into it. And I'm going to go put on my boots and I'm going to go over the stock exchange and do something with it. If you're a broker, it's a different story. <laughs> yeah, but then it's a whole different story, and you're a professional in it, and it really wouldn't be your passive income anyways. You would sound like a real estate agent. Okay. How you, how you get paid to become passive? You get a regular check that could, if I actively go work at it, be considered ordinary income. Regular check? A regular check. A regular paycheck from the investment, not a dividend check. A regular paycheck from the investment. From the investment, not a dividend check. Okay. Okay. I know that sounds like it's very, very close to each other, but one is a dividend check. The other one is a check that is a regular paycheck, but I didn't have to work for it. Okay, it just came to me out of activities that I started. But here's the final test. If I decide in the morning I want to go to work for it, okay, can I go down to the stock market and trade stocks? Again, if I'm licensed and there's a, the extreme case, yes, we can make an exception. But in general, no. But if I loan money to Tim and Tim's come and the investment's coming into me on a regular basis, right, I'm getting money back. That's an investment that's passive, right? But if today I want to go help Tim out and I really want to help him out and go play an active role in the business, can I walk down the street to him and say, hey, Tim, I know you're making your widgets. I think I can help you out. We, we can turn out 20 of them instead of the 10 that you've put, been turning out if we work together on it. He goes, yeah, you know, you're probably right. And so both of us start working on it together. And so we crank out 20 widgets. It's no longer a passive income, right? No, because you're actively Because I'm actively it. working on it. But I couldn't do that with the stocks, could I? No. I couldn't go down to the stock market and just do that. But when I was just sitting there and I just put some money into it, okay, and helped him out, it was passive income. But when I became actively involved with it, it was ordinary income. 
Now do you see the difference between them? I can't do that with the stocks. The stocks yeah. are, are separate. Uh, they're a separate thing of their own. I can't just walk down to the stock market and say, okay, today I'm going to start trading stocks. Okay. I mean, I could if I go to school, start, you know, getting my, my broker's license and start doing that. You know, there's an extreme case. But in reality, no, I can't just do that. So it's like um, my husband works for Intel, so he goes and he gets his, his uh, regular paycheck. Regular paycheck. Mm -hmm. But it, we get capital gains when we sell our Intel stock. Your Intel stock. Correct. There you go. And let's say on the side, he gave your mom $10,000 to crochet something, you know, so she can start a crochet business. And, or you did, okay. But she's just crocheting. And each week you get $100 back. Luckily out of the sales. Great, that's passive income that you kind of set up, right? But now you decided, you know, if I go help her out, she can even make more blankets. So you can go over to her and start helping her out and take an active role in it. Okay. You could actually start helping her make blankets. You can take more of an active role. Or maybe you can help her with the sales. You guys set up an Etsy store. And you're helping her with a website. And you're helping her with that sort of thing. See, the difference is you can't switch from it being passive to active with stocks. But with a passive income, if it's truly a passive income, you're getting a check with no activity that you did. But tomorrow, you can go start doing more at it and making an active role. And yeah. then it becomes ordinary income. And then it becomes ordinary income. You got it. Look at that. And it becomes ordinary. And it shifts from passive to ordinary. Okay. And that's the difference in how they're reported. The same is true for the businesses because for a sole proprietor, you can do that as a partner in a partnership. You can do that. You can be a silent partner or an active partner. Okay. And you can switch from one to the other. You can take an active role and that's the important thing. You can't do that with stocks with invest with an investment por portfolio. Okay. All right. Makes sense. You cannot do that in stocks. You can't go and become a stock. Well, you can't just go down to the stock market and start trading stocks, right? So stocks is not. Uh, stocks are not passive. Passive. No, they are, they get paid in dividend checks, and yeah. you do not have a passive income from it. It's a dividend check you get, and they're reported. Think about it. When you're doing taxes, okay, you see that you separate the dividends. The dividend benefit sec section is separate from the regular income section, isn't it? Right. Okay. That's because it gets handled differently. Okay. Dividends are not the same as, in as regular income or passive income. Okay. That's the difference. And that's, what's, that's one of the most important parts of it. Stocks, passive, and regular. I think I'm going to have to try to draw something out for you for those three so you can see them. All right, so we're going to jump from the, from the investment income to probably one of the most fun ones, okay? Barter income. Now, this is where a lot of <laughs> sole proprietors get in trouble. And this is where dis things get disallowed and where, you know, people end up trying to explain things that barter income is, tell you what, let me trade you this for that. Okay. Trade, let me trade you my car for your tractor. Or tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll mow your yard a couple of times if you make me something. You make me a sign for the front of my front of my business, or I'll trade you ten thousand of these for this. Now, why does this make life so interesting? Because it comes back to those gold coins. Comes back to fair market value. 
fair, fair market, market value. Yeah. That is probably the most fun thing in the world. Do you know why? I love to barter. <laughs> because who knows what something's <laughs> How much is the Mona Lisa worth? Millions. It's a piece of canvas with some paint on it. Okay, you know what its actual worth is? About a dollar. Okay, its actual material worth is about a dollar. No, because it's old canvas and old paint. It's old so canvas, it's that's true. <laughs> yeah, okay, there you go, it's old canvas. It starts to become its perceived thing now. Okay, got it. So, the Mona Lisa starts going up in value because people perceive it as painted by da Vinci in the 1600s. Okay, well, that cranked it up a little bit. It's unique. It has its, it, her eye perspective, which is supposed to be she looks at you no matter where you are in the room. Figure that one out. It's a painting technique. You know, it's uh, it just goes up in value. It sits in the Louvre. It doesn't do much. You know, I mean, I haven't seen it move much, and uh, it just goes up in value still. So everything is its perceived value. So when you're bartering, you know, here's what's really cool. So what happens when I trade my car for your tractor? Let's do that on a balance sheet. Sheila, can you do me a favor? Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop sharing, and I really want you to, can you show me, I don't know how you're going to do this. Maybe, maybe this would be better. I was going to have you show the whiteboard. I want you to do a transaction of what would happen if I sell you my car for your tractor. What counts well, as what? It, it would, we have to give valuation to both. There you go. And what do they count as what? Well, they're both assets, of course. Ah, but they're both assets to individuals. But for one, they're an expense. For one, they're a, a uh, uh, income. Well, one, one is an asset to the company, right? Uh -huh. The company that owns that asset that they're using to, do, to make income with it. Right. Okay. So we're, so we're sending that asset, and what we're going to do is we're going to basically sell that asset to somebody else for a tractor, like the car is being sold for a tractor. So Okay, so the car is being sold for a tractor. The car I'm using for a is that the business side? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the car is an asset to the business. It's right. got a value. Okay. Okay. Now, the tractor Oh, uh, I see where you're going with this. Ah. If, if it's an even trade, then the your your loss is zero. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, then then the asset is equal to the, the cost of the uh, tractor. Right. But so if the, the tractor is worth more, then you have an income. And it's income, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if it's actually the tractor is worth less than the car, then it's a loss. Right. So we have to start figuring out the fair market value for everything from a tractor, a car, as you can see here, a loaf of bread and some wheat. <laughs> um everything has its perceived value and here's the other thing that's really important now this is probably the one thing that as when you've done real estate if anybody you know anybody's done real estate yeah, I've done realtor, real estate as a realtor how much is the house worth to the seller versus the market value it's what the, the market is is in that neighborhood, depending on on uh, other houses that Just have been sold or I, I on. Guess, I, I guess maybe I didn't say it right. Well, you, you're talking about intrinsic value because uh -huh. I mean, the seller might think his house is worth a million dollars. Realistically, according to the market, his house might be worth five hundred thousand. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sheila got well, was the the point I was trying to make. Thank you. Um, what ends up happening? is there's an intrinsic value and then there's the fair market value because when it says what the market would sell for at 
un, you know, a, an undistressed sale. So in other words, nobody's emotionally involved. So what happens when they're emotionally involved in the sale of their house? They don't want to sell. They're being forced to sell. They have to move to another yeah, state. Fine. They have to move to another state because they got relocated for work or whatever it may be. I don't want to leave. Dad, I am not leaving this place. I'm sticking here until school is done. I don't care what you say. I'm staying right here. And the wife's going, you know what? Hey, this is ridiculous. Maybe you could live there and for a while and you could run an apartment there and we can stay here for a while until, you know, whatever, because, you know, the kids have only got a couple of years left in school, you know, and this house means a lot to us. You know, all the work we did on the yard, you know, that fountain out front that you built, now, that's worth a lot of money. That's, you did a lot of work on that. That's a lot of time. How much is the house worth? It doesn't matter. To well, the what matters actual, is what the market will bear. Thank you. To the to the outside world, does it matter that there's a fountain in front? No. Does that affect its fair market value? Hey. Well, it may a little bit, but how much is not it? The actually amount that the, uh, not really. Invested, yeah. How and not the amount that the seller is going to try to assume? Yeah. Yeah, may affect it by a hundred bucks, maybe. You know, but uh, in reality, it's not even one of the things you look at when you're pulling up comparables. Okay, and it may even be a detriment because some people don't want a fountain in front of their house, so it's going to cost to take it down. Yeah, so, swimming pools. Yeah, swimming pool. There you go. Hot tubs. How many hot tubs are given away oh, because <laughs> because nobody wants a hot tub? I love hot tubs. I've had one all my life. So, but hey, there's a lot of people who can't stand them. Why do you have them? They're ridiculous. Okay. So, what is the value between what is perceived because there are intrinsic values versus the fair market value? And it comes down to what will the market actually sell for? And that's actually one of the things as a realtor when you do things. Um, one of the hardest things you're up against is, I'm going to list my property. I want you know, the house down the street sold for... $350,000. All right, my house is much nicer than his. I should be able to sell for $400,000. Yeah, the, the, they're the worst. That's why in the listing contracts, I always had 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 a certain times where we did price reductions because, I mean, these people, have, they're emotionally invested in their home and they think it's the best thing ever. And Well, but, here's the first question. Somebody, is the house down the street even comparable? Well, yeah. No, it's not. It's house well, it's only if it's only no if it's idea. the same. Only it's if it's the same, same type. House. Yeah. Uh, you have to you know, compare it. Yeah, obviously. You have to compare it. It may not be a comparable at all. This is a three-bedroom, two-bathroom house. Is what you're trying to sell. And that's a five-bedroom house built three years later, on a twice on a lot twice the size. Is it comparable? Yeah. No. Not at all. Not even close. But it's the the sellers in this house are saying, well, my house is much nicer than that one. Um, your house isn't even close to that one, you know, but I should be able to sell for more than them. Yeah, but they um, don't listen. Well, but that's my point. There's an intrinsic value too. So when we're talking about fair market value, remember the thing is the most important part of that is it has to be in a non-distressed environment. In other words, they cannot have an emotional attachment to it. So as sellers, do they have emotional attachments to it? Yes. All the time. So what happens usually to a, a real estate agent who's got to go in there and explain to them, I know your house to you is worth this amount. I have a friend who's doing this right now who's trying to sell their house, and they think that it's over in Gresham, and they think it's worth this huge amount of money. And I hate to tell them that your house ain't worth that. And they are actually going to a real estate agent who has basically said, sure, I'll list it for that. And they've asked for several real estate agents. They won't list it at that price. But one said, sure, I'll list it at that price. Do you know why? Because, because they're going to reduce it after they list it. Because what they're going to do is they're going to milk it for buyers. 
they're going to have people come and look at the property and go, oh, this property isn't the right one for you, huh? Okay, I've got another one over here. So they're just going to wait for buyers to keep calling in. And they're going to show them other properties that they will buy and just use it for that. Oh, boy. Yeah, it works as a great draw for them to come in and show them other properties that they would buy, that, would, that are priced right. And then eventually in three months or whatever, when the listing is about ready to expire, they'll go to them and say, you know, you haven't gotten any offers on it. We listed it at the, at the price you wanted. Um, the comparables are not coming in at what you want because the fair market value, and here's the most important part, the fair market value shows that it's not listed, it, it not that. Now, here's more important. In real estate, and in all things, actually, cars, anything of value where you would actually have to typically finance it, that's the important word. What happens with that fair market value? What's really important about that fair market value? If you're talking about real estate and I want to list my house at $500,000, my house is worth $300,000, but I want my $500,000. What's going to happen if I have a signed around contract? What are they going to do after the signed around contract? I don't know. They're going to get an appraisal from a professional. And what's going to happen is, is that appraiser is a third party who is a non-emotional fair market value analyzer. That's what their job is. And they're going to appraise that property and they're going to appraise it based on the true comparables of the area. Now, sometimes you're going to fight it and say, oh, I want it worth more. Well, you want it worth more because your seller won't sell unless it's worth more. Um, but they're going to give you a fair market value. That's their job. And the thing is, what happens when that fair market value that they're saying is much less than your contract price that you have agreed on? You either have to, the seller or the buyer either has to make up the difference or you have to do a price reduction and, and uh, mm -hmm. sell it at that market because the, the bank won't loan on it. The bank won't loan on it. Yep. What will happen is remember because it needs to be securable. So in other words, its value to the bank is whatever the true fair market value is. So with the fair market value, that applies to cars, that applies to houses. That's what an appraiser's job is, to look for the fair market value of things. Okay? And they have a strict set of guidelines that they have to adhere to to determine what that fair market value is. And they can't deviate from that. They actually have a license which says, I'm not going to deviate from this. I'm going to give you my fair market assumption. And I won't deviate from it no matter what. And the thing is that's really bad to, with that is when you get a low appraisal. And, and at some loans, the appraisal will attach to the house for like six months. Yep. So if you have a difficult seller, it's like you're not going to sell at all, ever, for yeah. at least the six months because, you know, the bank will look at the past appraisal. Now, here's more important. What happens to the neighborhood? I'm just curious. What happens to the neighborhood when it gets that appraisal? Property values. You just set an go up or down. You just set an established fair market value in that neighborhood for all the surrounding houses. So what happens if you have a builder who's building a whole bunch of houses in a neighborhood that originally are valued at like nine hundred thousand dollars, right? And it only costs like $600,000 to build, you know, for the land and everything, the acquisition loan it costs about $650,000 to build and it appraises out. It should appraise out at about $800,000, $900,000. But in the build, one of the first buyers is in financial trouble. So you now have a whole bunch of houses in a subdivision 
And that first buyer who's in financial trouble sells his house at a fire sale. He's willing to take the loss and all. And sells that house for $650,000 just to get out of it. What happens to the rest of the houses in that whole subdivision? They're valued at $650,000. Thank you. They're no longer valued at $800,000. You have a perfect comparable to the other houses in the neighborhood that are all similar by the same builder built at the same time, probably on the same type of lot, probably on the same size lot, because most engineering plans are for about the same size lot, built at the same time with pretty much the same uh, plans. They may vary by a few square feet and that sort of thing. But what now happens to the value of every house in that subdivision is they go into the toilet. That's why foreclosures are so bad for a neighborhood. Uh-huh. Now you understand how income works at a property. So what would happen to the value of a company and its income level if, let's say, it was a builder and it owned all those houses it was trying to sell and one of the houses that happens to? What happens to his profit? Because what happens to all the loans? What becomes the selling point for all the houses? $650,000, you have a perfect comparable. And you can't get rid of it either. It doesn't go away because you don't like it. They make no profit because they spent $650,000 to build it. To build them. They have no well, you profit. better sit on it for a while. There you go. All because of one person. Yes, I know this from experience. I have actually seen a subdivision that happened to. That's why I was like, I wanted to kill them. So, <laughs> it was really bad seeing that. I saw so many investors die on that subdivision. All because one, one of the investors had to dive out of it and dived out of it that way and set the precedent for every house in a, nine, in a 93 house development. Yeah. So that is, when it comes down to it, how fair market value works. So barter works based on that principle. So if I go get a loaf of bread from Franz, and I go get a loaf of bread from Dave's Killer Bread, and I go get basically the Walmart cheap brand, okay? How much is my perceived value if I'm into health food? If I'm into health food, well, maybe Dave's Killer Bread, which has more grains in it, is better for me and worth more, right? What if I'm really hungry and don't have a whole lot of money and want the cheapest bread I can find? Then I want them all priced at, you know, Literally, that one that I got from Walmart that's the cheapest bread is probably the best. What if I have had this family influence? My family's been buying Fran's bread for the past 200 years, and we love Fran's bread. So it's the only kind of bread we buy. That one's valued at the highest, right? So it comes down to what will the market bear? Now, how big is the market? Fair market value changes based upon who's being asked. Okay, based on that perception. So remember, fair market value is a fluctuating range. It's really not a set number. Okay, it's actually a window. And usually it's within about 5% of plus or minus 5% as to what its actual value would be valued at. Okay, so, but just remember this. Barter is probably the most fun because you get to negotiate everything. And it's based on the perception of whatever its fair market value is. But its most important fact is it has to be just like an appraiser. It has to be a non-biased analysis of what its value is. And that's the key to it. It has to be a non-biased analysis. Okay? And those are all the business income. 
and what we do with them and how we treat them. Rental properties, passive income, uh, regular income. Regular income is just the income from your services offered. All right. Yep. Well, I think that was a pretty full day. Um, Ryan, I, I just did a journal entry for you showing the, the barter for the truck for the tractor. Awesome. And, and an uneven uh, transaction. Awesome. You are great. Let me do this. I'm going to stop sharing. Sheila, can you share that? Yeah, sure. Because that's what I was trying to get across, that it's like it's an uneven one where suddenly you have to count one as, oh, wait a minute here. I gave you a loaf of bread for a tractor. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I have income from this. Oh, I think she just dropped off. Her, there she goes. I think she's back here. She was switching her computers probably. Okay, well, we'll give her a second. But anyways, let me clear this up. Questions, you guys, from outside of what Sheila's doing right now. Do you guys understand more about passive income and the difference between it and a stock? Just to, that, that in itself is a big difference in how it's treated and even how it's taxed. Yeah, I got, I got it. Okay, because, I mean, I know it sounds a little strange when you think about it, but all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a minute. No, that's not a passive income. <laughs> I am actively doing stuff in it or wait a minute. That is my passive income so I can treat it. I can carry it over because that's the one cool thing is to carry over with passive income. That's really cool because if you carry it over to the next year, all of a sudden you can offset stuff uh, for the next year. So if it's your startup year, carry that loss over with those two forms because it's only for passive income, by the way, but you carry it over to that next year and offset to the next year. There she is. Hey, Sheila. Yeah, something happened and I lost you. I just got you back. No problem. We were waiting for you. Okay. All right. So can you share that screen? Because I'd love to see this. Yeah. Working on it. Hang so on. I had a question about bartering. You got in it. You got it. Because I run into this a few times in some of the quizzes I've taken and I seem to get it wrong every time. What's that? Like, say, uh, generic terms here. Party A, mm -hmm. a lawyer performs a service for Party B uh, that she normally charges, say, $8,000 for. Yep. And the guy's going to, you know, agree to make payments or whatever, take care of this. And for some reason, he can't. And so he ends up offering her a piece of equipment or, or, or a piece of artwork something, or something in place of it okay in place of it and the value of this item was ten thousand dollars and so he gives her this item my thought is well the service originally was eight thousand and the value of this they don't give any backup on the value of it that he gave her but she ends up having to take two thousand dollars income versus uh, uh, above the 8,000 is the way it worked out in the question. And that, that perplexed me because the value okay. of her service was already negotiated and agreed upon by them. So why wouldn't the item she took just be that value? Does that make my question make sense at all? Okay. So she is an attorney. She's doing services for $8,000 and she was getting uh, income from it, but the person couldn't pay. So they had to give a car or whatever the object was valued yeah, at ten thousand dollars. Right, good thing, yeah. And she yeah. took it. And she took the the item in place of the payment because of the situation the person was in. Right. And so, I mean, she I understand. Had get, she had to get. How do you know where the value the ten thousand the car came from specifically? You know, is it brand new? Is it used? Or didn't. Well, here's the thing: you have to that. assume that when they say that the, you're going to make an assumption when in the question and there's only in for the questions because normally you would just say okay it's so we're just going to do an even trade for it but in that what question, came out like the question it said that she had to take a two thousand dollar income she does 
Yeah, and, and that was what confused me. Cause I was because like, the value of the car, and that's actually what Sheila is bringing up here, mm -hmm. is the value of the car has a value of $10,000. The value of the services are $8,000. Okay, so that leaves an income of $2,000 that the attorney has to show because it's being brought in. They now have a $10,000 asset. Okay, there you go. She was sharing it here. Still. All right. Is there like a hard rule on that, or I mean, well, is it, the, the stuff attorney, we've read here talks about like if you guys agree on a fair market value, then that's acceptable. See, if the attorney had said, "Yeah, we'll just count it as zero, that's that's good because that's what it should have been. But mm -hmm. you know, it's one of those. Okay, this is kind of a dumb example kind of thing if you want to think about it that way. I understand. I just trying to express something. So yeah, yeah. I've had that happen a couple than, times than, than on, on quizzes that I've missed right. it. And yeah. So. Ah, there you go. It's a journal entry. So what it's showing is you have a tractor for fifteen thousand dollars and a truck for fourteen thousand dollars. So you are taking your. Actually, tell you what, Sheila, you explain. This is better. You explain it, Sheila. Well, you've got a tractor that you're exchanging for a truck. Mm -hmm. So you're debiting the tractor 15000 and you're crediting the truck 14000 because that's what the value of the truck is. So in order to, to balance the entry, you need to, you need to add $1,000 worth of income to show the difference. And so what, what's going to happen here is your new asset's going to be the truck, and you're going to be putting a thousand dollars worth of income uh, into your P&L. Exactly, you're going to show a thousand dollars profit, more or less. Yeah, mm -hmm. income from it because you have, in the end, it's it's got to balance out that there's fifteen thousand dollars on each side. Correct. So it's the same thing, uh, Garrett, with what you're talking about. On the one side, there's $8,000. On the other side, there's $10,000. So she has to make up for the difference by adding to see where this would be. This would be $2,000. This would be her. That's the value of her car that you were looking at. This would be the value of that attorney's. Uh, the truck would be the value of the attorney services. And the difference would be $2,000 if you want to think about it there from, from the example you were showing. I guess the way I was thinking about it was that well, if, if the debt was eight thousand and it was agreed that she would receive the car for the eight thousand debt, why couldn't it just be valued at eight thousand instead of ten? And that was what was because unfortunately the question. So, and, and so because because unfortunately they have to take it at its fair market value, okay. and so even though it's fair market value, you'd think that it would just be counted as eight thousand dollars. Its actual fair market value is ten thousand dollars. So they treat it as a ten thousand dollar item. So okay. there's a two thousand dollar difference. But Sheila, this is perfect. They got a tractor. They've got a truck. They traded the truck. Got a track. Got a tractor for it. Which is, uh, they traded the tractor. Other way around. Yeah. Other way around. Uh, they they traded the tractor. Got a truck, and basically a thousand bucks. Right. So. That's or what even if they didn't get the thousand dollars, if they it was an even trade, they right. still have to show the thousand dollars worth they of still, offset. Right, they'd have to show that allocation of a thousand dollars to offset its overall value. Right. So, this is perfect with a barter. They've got to equal out on both sides. So in the end, they should equal zero. You know, they're they're fifteen fifteen, and What's fun though is playing with that fair market value because you can make it out of just, just about anything. Because unless you are a third party, and that's where bartering becomes so much fun. Because when you're bartering, everybody has a has a value. All right, and if you want to adjust that value, you basically can play with it. Okay, you play with the value based on people's emotions. If they're emotionally attached to it, you can crank the value up through the ceiling. Okay, if you know they're emotionally attached to something. If you have something for sale and you want them to buy it, find out what their emotional attachment is to it. 
Okay, find out why they want to buy it. Find out what part of them is interested in buying it. And if you play on that, you can shoot it through the roof. That's how sales actually works. Okay. Or if somebody wants to get rid of something, all right, find out why they don't like it. Find out why they want to get rid of it. Okay. This is basic sales 101. Find out what their rejection is. Okay. Find out why they don't like it or why they don't want something. Turn it around. Attach it to an emotional need. Okay. Find out why. People buy and sell on emotion. Well, same thing with fair market value. Okay. People assume the fair market value based on their emotional attachment. And the problem is it cannot be attached to their to the fair market to the fair market value. It cannot be attached to emotion. Okay. No, like I said, Sheila, thank you. That was perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to show. Yeah, it was I perfect. Thank different. you. I want to show I want to show one with a difference where all of a sudden you go, oh wait a minute. I've got an income here that I didn't even know about. Yep, you do. Because it had a different value. Okay. And you have to account for it. Ironically enough, the IRS insists you account for it. Okay. Yes. All right. Questions, guys. I know that was a lot for today. I think Amanda's sitting back there going, you know, if I could type on chat right now, I'd like fill up like four pages, you know. So. Ryan, with regards yeah. to Garrett question, mm -hmm. I have read that when there's an agreed value, generally it is the fair market value, but when there's an agreed value of the service, that will be the the value mm -hmm. that it'll be the assigned value yeah and it's yeah that's normally what happens that if you have an agreed upon value of a for an item even though it may or may not be more or less um it will assume that value more or less but in garrett's case they stated that its value was ten thousand dollars so that is the fair market value yeah but the uh, that, value is eight thousand yeah the services were valued at eight thousand dollars, so the difference was two thousand dollars. So that meant she had to assume two more thousand dollars of income because she what she was getting was two thousand dollars worth two thousand dollars more than her services. So she was getting paid more than her services cost. So she had to assume it as income. So is it right? Well, hey, it's taxes. We got to go by our ass law. You're doing better hey, than Garrett, is this goodbye to you since you're going to be working next week? Garrett. <laughs> Garrett, are you there? Maybe yes, not. I'm here. I'm here. Uh, hey, sorry. Garrett, is this your last session with us? I believe so, yeah, because I'll be working 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. So. Well, good luck on the new job, Garrett. Thank you. I'll miss you. Yeah, I'll miss you guys. I'll try to catch up with the videos and. Uh, oh yeah, well, we'll I'll, I'll get together with you, Garrett, and we'll we'll get you caught up with everything. So, we'll keep you up to date. Ryan, can you? uh give us the presentation materials in the chat room the one you use today um actually it's too big i think for the chat room ah, okay but uh i can put it up so you guys can get it um give me just a little bit i'm actually like i said i was changing everything so i've got everything to put up there but uh i just didn't get it up there yet honestly so I will, you'll be able to get everything from the website itself, from the actual website. And that's what the plan is for this weekend. So, okay. 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 All right, guys. I want you guys to have a great Labor Day weekend. We are not getting together on Monday. Okay. So we are getting together on Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. See everybody on Wednesday. Okay. Everybody Bye. have fun and have a great weekend and be safe. Okay. Have a safe weekend, okay. everybody. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.